If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here. For this commentary podcast, I'm joined by comedian and musician Nick Helm to discuss the 1993 blockbuster and one of the most successful films of the 1990s, Jurassic Park. How you doing, Nick? It's been a long time since our last commentary, which I believe was... Was it Highlander? Uh, it may have been Highlander. Yeah, <laughs> it may have been Judge Dredd. Uh, did we do Con Air? Did we do Con Air? Yes, we did. Yes, that was, a good, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, they're all just... What I find is if you only watch good films, then, uh, then you save a lot of time, really, don't you? <laughs> You do, you do. <laughs> Luckily, we've chosen a great movie. Yes, yes. I, I, I just, I just to clarify, I did also just call Judge Dredd a good film, and uh, and I stand by that. If you listen to the commentary, okay, folks. If you wish to sync this commentary with your own copy of Jurassic Park, put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Great. Great. <laughs> I've pressed play. I've successfully pressed play. Got the old Universal logo. And that is, yeah, great. It's fine. I can't believe it. I'm not For the listeners at home, I'm not very good with technology. <laughs> it's a miracle that this is happening. <laughs> so, Nick, so Nick, you saw this back in 93, right, at the cinema, like everyone else? I did see it back in 1993. I've got my sound on. How do I take my sound off? <laughs> All oh, right, it's fine. Is it? I don't know. Um, yes, I saw it back in 1993. Um, I tell you what, um, I was remembering this the other day. Um, so 1993 came along and I went on a family holiday to Orlando. Um, wow. Orlando, Florida. And it was, and I remember it was, uh, so... It was a really great holiday. It was it was the summer when they were testing out the Jaws ride. They'd just finished the Jaws ride for Florida and we went one day and we went on it. It was amazing. And then we went back and the ride wasn't there because they were only previewing it. And so we were really lucky. And our tour bus driver kept going on and on about Jurassic Park that he'd just seen it. He was older, but now I look back, he must have been about 22. And he, his mind had been melted by the fact that he'd just seen Jurassic Park. And there was nothing like this at the time. There was sort of like a hint of what was to come with Terminator 2. Yeah, in terms of visual effects, wasn't it? Because it, I compare this uh, film to, I suppose, to another, the previous generation who got to see Star Wars in the cinema for the first time and seeing this next step in visual effects. And then Jurassic Park, I think, made that next big step with... Uh, you know, with the CG dinosaurs, and it just like, yeah, people's reaction was just like incredible. Just like T two obviously had done something really special, but this was like, kind of to, to many people, it, it it looked real. You know, these dinosaurs had come to life. I think that I used I used Jurassic Park as sort of like a watershed, like landmark moment. Yeah. So things were before Jurassic Park, and things were after Jurassic Park. I found out the other day that Justin Bieber was born in 1994 and I was like I can't believe it he's younger than Jurassic Park and it's sort of like it's like an everyday it's not my favorite film and it's not even you know my favorite director but um but I would say that yeah I've got a weird sort of like um uh, relationship with Steven Spielberg where I think Jaws and Jurassic Park are in my well, Jaws is definitely in my top five. And I think it's probably, if not my favourite film, the best film ever made. Um, I think it, I just don't think you can beat Jaws. I think that... It's yeah, very tough to beat Jaws. Yeah. As an experience, you know, I still can't go into a swimming pool at night. <laughs> I can't <laughs> put my feet on the floor when I'm watching shark footage. Um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, it, it messed me up for life. And Jurassic Park kind of... Um, uh, it's weird because there was sort of like it's not a perfect film 
But I think as an adaptation, it sort of like leaves out what it, it very much like what he did with Jaws. He leaves out the stuff that he doesn't need and he sort of streamlines the story uh, and makes it uh, more kind of like uh, palatable in places. And uh, yeah. he takes like the rough edges off, you know. Well, yeah, because I, I, I presume you've read Michael Crichton's book. Yeah, I loved the book, and I loved um, I loved the Lost Worlds as well. I thought those two, but I, the film, the Lost World film, I think is one of the worst films I've ever seen. I, I hate it so much, uh, but I, I hate think it's, it. I think it's Spielberg's weakest film for me. I, th- I um, think it's I think it's, probably it's, along with um, Indiana Jones Four, maybe. But I, um, I do you know what I think? I saw Indiana Jones Four again. Uh, after like all of the hype, maybe a couple of years ago, and I didn't hate it as much as I thought I did. Mm. And I can completely Mm. understand why they made it. But also, it was 20 years after the original franchise. Jurassic Park 2 is a follow-up building off the success of Jurassic Park while Jurassic Park was still hot. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's kind of like... um, uh, And also, he's made sequels before. It's not his first sequel, so so I think the Lost World is sort of less forgivable for that because it's a follow up yes. to an amazing film. Um, but yeah, it's kind of you know the, the it's not sloppy filmmaking, but there are things where kind of you notice stuff later on, and we'll get to that, I suppose. Not that I want to like pick holes in this. It's such a good film. Continuity gaps. Yeah, but you get that in Jaws as well, where the guy's leg gets beaten off, and then when you see it later, it's got a sock on it, but he wasn't wearing a sock, um, or or the other way around. And and there's sort of like little bits like that where you go, well, if this is a master filmmaker, then how is he leaving continuity errors like that in? But I think it... Mm. I think he's so good that you don't notice that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, if you're caring about the story, then those sort of errors are just are not really your one's concern. Because um, I read the book. I never read the book as a kid, the Michael Crichton novel, but I read it a couple of years ago. And um, I thought it was a very good book. I, but I actually preferred the film to it. Um, I, it, was, uh, it was. There's a lot of action in the book, which I thought was a little bit kind of dull. When you hear kind of, you know... Uh, especially action in a book, it's just like and this happened and this happened and this happened. It's yeah. not very exciting. You want to see, you want to see if the film needs to do that. Um, but there's a lot of stuff they cut out, which is kind of intriguing. But they would deploy some of those scenes in the sequels, like the little girl at the beginning of Lost World. That's in the the first book, and yeah. uh, the pterodactyls in the cage. That's in number three. Yeah. Um, and I think also the the, the sequence where the in the book where the T Rex is following them following them down the river. That's yeah. kind of deployed in the third one, and there's the waterfall bit as well. There's a bit with the waterfall. Yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah, it was interesting to sort of see all that. But it, it was reading up about it when I reviewed the film years ago. Was um, that so many film studios wanted the book before it was even published? You know, they mm. loved the idea of this, and obviously with Spielberg involved, he wanted to make Schindler's List, and Universal wouldn't fund that if he'd he'd had to make Jurassic Park first. So, you know, on the other hand, he's making this fun popcorn blockbuster movie and then flip side of that is really depressing movie about the holocaust yeah which was actually kind of you know is the, the is a masterpiece and probably the film he probably would i don't know may may say would prefer to be remembered by and more so than jurassic park perhaps. i don't know um, i don't i don't know i think that um i think they're both culturally significant in different ways aren't of course they? yeah um and and basically i would say jurassic park Using technology, you know, obviously he had such a difficult time with Bruce the Shark when he made Jaws. This is sort of like his his. This is sort of like his second stab at having a go at um, a monster mm. movie like that. You know, yeah. where the technology uh, can almost allow him anything he wants to do. Um, mm. And then on the other hand, you've got uh, Schindler's List, which is kind of um, filmmaking in the style of, um, uh, you know, he made films like uh, Colour Purple before that. And so, obviously, he's trying to make kind of uh, dramatic films that shine a light on, um, uh, you know, political or... um, or sort of important moments of history, you know, instead of being uh... global uh, moments in history. And so he's trying to to do that with one hand and then... 
Uh, and on the other hand, he's trying to entertain people. And if you look at 1993, he did both. Uh, and Jurassic Park, crazy, yeah. Jurassic Park won all of the uh, te- te- no- technological uh, Oscars, and then Schindler's List won all the other Oscars. And there's no other filmmaker <laughs> that could really do that. He cleaned up. Schindler's List and Jurassic Park both feel like Steven Spielberg movies, and maybe Schindler's List mm. was sort of like a, a look at what Spielberg would become, and Jurassic Park yeah. was kind of like this is me at the very height of uh, all of the technology is supporting me and this is what I can do for like a roller coaster popcorn movie. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that was kind of... You could, you could have seen that. You could have seen that his sort of transition, isn't it? Because this could be him saying, okay, this is like the somewhat maybe the last of my big summer blockbuster kind of affairs, then going into sort of more serious stuff because he would follow that up with... Saving Private Ryan, but also you'd have to do a sequel to this, which she was clearly not interested in doing. Um, but, you know, it's a weird thing at the time, because I, I saw this in the cinema, like the classic blockbuster mentality. I was queuing around the MGM cinema in the rain, and um, I still have vivid memories of certain sequences in the film. Obviously, the, the T-Rex sequence, and when the raptor jumps up to grab the girl's leg, and they've got that sort of the CGI, that stunt lady's face out. Um, I still remember all of that. And um, but at the time, there was this kind of certain craze. I'm not sure if you remember, Nick, like of like kids obsessed with dinosaurs, even before the film came out. Oh, other films had done it, like Super Mario Brothers had incorporated dinosaurs. That TV show called Dinosaurs, who it was kind of Jim Henson animatronic yeah. style show, but like The Simpsons. So there was kind of something in the air, you know, about dinosaurs. Yeah, but kids always love dinosaurs. I mean, I grew up. Oh, they in, do. Yeah, they I grew do. up in the eighties, and I grew up in London, and I used to go to the National History uh, Museum every other weekend, and we'd see. I didn't go that much, but I did go, and uh, and we'd see like all of like the uh, fossilized dinosaur bones and stuff. And kids love Jurassic Park. I love Jurassic Park. Oh, oh, sorry, dinosaurs, and then. When Jurassic Park came out and the teaser came out with the amber, the cutting of the bit of amber out that we see at the beginning of the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still, I, th- I still didn't really know what Jurassic Park was about. I thought maybe it was about a museum that came to life, but not in this right. way. I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, and obviously, the like you said, the book. Everyone was bidding for the book. I think at one point they wanted Tim Burton to do it which would have been a completely different... Well, he'd just done Batman, I suppose, and they were like, this is the guy to do blockbusters. But... um... Well, this film follows the same sort of marketing mentality of Batman, doesn't it? It follows that sort of trait of the heavy merchandise overload with everything, you know, like the the toys, all the video games. And weirdly, some of my friends got the toys, but that was in that certain age. I was coming up to 12, so it was that sort of age point where you sort started losing interest in toys, you know. So um, that was that sort of franchise I didn't grab onto as a kid, but I played the video games, so. <laughs> though. Because they're everywhere. You of know. Jurassic Park? Yeah, yeah. What Mega were those Drive like? Super Nintendo. Well, the Super Nintendo ones, that kind of top-down game where you've got, you're playing as Alan Grant and you go inside the, the buildings, it's kind of like a, a Doom-style perspective like Mode 7 graphics and the Mega Drive one, you can play as a Raptor or Alan Grant and just say it's a traditional platformer. Um, so yeah, I think the Mega Drive one sold sold Gangbusters, really. But it was, uh, I mean, there was a game on a 3DO, it was kind of weird mini games. There was a Mega CD one, it was like a point and click adventure. There was so much of it. Yeah. Um, along with all the toys and merchandise as well. So it was, you couldn't escape it. The summer no. of 93 was Jurassic Park. Um, I really like, well, do I? I'm not sure if I like it or not, but there are these little Sp- Spielbergian flourishes that he has, like when uh, Richard Attenborough shakes uh, Sam Neill's hand and then he he blows dust off his hand to sort of like yeah, yeah, clean yeah. it. And you kind of like go, well, there's no, that, there's no way that all of that dust transferred onto his hand. But it's kind of like a Spielbergian kind of like, let's let's put stuff in there for the sake of putting it in there um it kind of it's sort of like a whimsical flourish that spielberg uses um what i would say about terminator 2 is that you know the special effects in terminator 2 felt like they embellished the practical effects whereas oh, sure, sure. when jurassic park came out it was kind of like oh you can do anything now like mm. you couldn't tell the difference back then between 
the animatronic dinosaurs and the CGI dinosaurs. That T Rex attack yeah. is absolutely yeah. seamless. Perfect blend. Or, or it still is. It still is impressive. It's still really impressive. You know, it, um, the uh, the CGI. I think only really started to age quite recently. Um, you could go back and watch in this particular film. You think. In this specific film that we are watching, there's sequences right now. where they're getting chased by the um, those kind of group of dinosaurs. I can't remember the names. I also get dinosaur names, but they're kind of running away from it. Then the T Rex turns up and Co- starts the, eating them. The, the Gallimimus. Gallimimus, is it? Yeah, I and, think so. Um, yeah, that sort of doesn't hold up quite well. But I think when things are kind of s- no slow moving, it sort of kind but of. But that works. was da- that was daylight as well. That scene, and uh, yeah. you know, yeah. and it didn't have like the rain and the dark to sort of like hide it. You know about the Goonies connection, where uh, all of the Goonies are dressed uh, like various versions of Wayne Knight. Oh yeah, just like well, he's dressed like yeah, exactly Wayne Knight. Yeah, Newman. So new man. So who's uh, who's this? This is um, Mouth right now, right? This would be Corey Feldman. Or is it? And then Sean Astin wears a yellow coat, and um, he wears something else at some point, and he's one of the other Goonies. But like, uh, they they costumed him based on th- uh, what three of the Goonies look like in the Goonies. Chunk. Chunk. Um, yeah, that's right. He wears the Hawaiian shirt, doesn't he? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. so I didn't really know anything about Jurassic Park coming out. And when it came out, um, I loved it. Uh, what I loved about it was how scary it was. At those days, they got away with so much, you know what I mean? It's be slapped with a 12 or a 15. If you were Spielberg, I think that if it was anyone... If it was anyone other than Spielberg, it would have been a 15. Like Gremlins was a 15, uh, you know, when it came to VHS in, in the UK. Um because this this was this was labelled a PG, wasn't it? But below the poster had like this kind of box, didn't it? Saying any children under eight years old need to be accompanied by a parent. You know. Yeah. Um, and it was it was terrifying, but in a really fun way. And that's what's so great about it. I think is that there will be, um, you know, like the bit when the T Rex is chasing them in the jeep. And it'll be, you know, you'll be filled with adrenaline and it'll be terrifying. And then all of a sudden Jeff Goldblum will say something. And it's not like in a Marvel way where it sort of bursts the bubble a bit. It's kind of like mm. it's still, there's still context, you know. Um, and you can be a fan of the Marvel stuff or not or whatever. But, like, I just think that this was before then where there didn't have to be a punchline after everything. And they really helped kind of, relieve the tension in the room. Um, uh, yeah, Jeff Goldblum's incredible in this film. Oh, well, this is like the time where he was like, you know, he always played quirky, weird characters. And this was kind of him playing this kind of sexy, kind of charismatic character, you know, but it's all got these Jeff Goldblum quirks to him. He's always got those quirks, which kind of makes him just so lovable, you know. Lovely ha- ha- stuff, all, all shot in Hawaii, isn't it? Then all the sort of, um, interior stuff, I think, is that California? I think they did. Um, yeah, and there was obviously a hurricane that hit the set and destroyed a lot of the well, set. Was it a great idea, wasn't it? Because they they weren't they hadn't finished the the sets on in Hawaii, so they basically made up the idea that it was kind of unfinished when they arrived, so they could show you all the scaffolding and stuff where it was actually wasn't actually finished. So they sort of deploy that in, into the script. This bit with the uh, seatbelt. Uh, where he uses two female sections of the seatbelt to make the seatbelt work. And that's <laughs> Spielberg saying, oh, female dinosaurs can uh, uh, breed. <laughs> that's, that's like a little, you see, life finds a way. He's managed to, he's managed to sort his seatbelt <laughs> seat out. Seatbelts find a way, you know. Um, why he's only putting the seatbelt on now when they're landing is beyond me. So what do you think of the uh, Jurassic Park theme tune? Do you think it was kind of like another sort of surefire hit for John Williams, another cracking theme tune? It's an instant classic. Um, it feels mm. nostalgic. It, it felt nostalgic even when you're listening to it. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it is it, weird. It, it, it's because it, may, it it's such an amazing uh, score and theme tune. It makes you, uh, obviously, with the context of the film, but it kind of like it makes you think of the awe 
of uh, seeing these beautiful, huge creatures, but also it makes you feel like you're <laughs> at a theme park. You know, it's kind yeah, of like, yeah. it's that, like that childhood thing where it's kind of like you're seeing something incredible and at the end when they use it and they're flying away spoilers alert spoiler alert um <laughs> it, it kind of like it, it makes you feel nostalgic for the adventures that you've just been on uh, it's it's a different mm. kind of score to something like indiana jones but it's um or jaws you know where was well, that style isn't it, of um that style of john williams where it's a little bit of hook in this score as well that sort of um as you were saying that sort of uh sort of childhood sort of memories and nostalgia kind of thrown into it and whenever you I hear that music you think of dinosaurs or if you see dinosaurs you think of that music it's just kind of the link together yeah. so perfectly and you couldn't think of any other music that would fit the jaws the jaws music is selling you on the fact that there's this you know lethal predator that's in the ocean that's going to kill you mm. and this is just selling you on all of the majesty because the storyline the storyline is about the fact that this is a great thing. They've built this park and people are going to be able to see dinosaurs for the first time. This is a really great thing. And that's what the score is sort of like selling you on before it goes yeah, to shit. Yeah. Whereas Jaws is always about the fact that, you know, this beach is a death trap and you will die. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's sort of like this amazing thing where it kind of like sweeps you along on the adventure. This is one of my all time, I hate this bit, I hate it. It, where she claws her sunglasses oh yeah like nobody no this is not a this is just a, this is the only reaction you would ever find in a Spielberg film but um yeah 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 that's a trait of his isn't it like extra sort of bits to do to sort of extend the business scene, you know just I mean? to sort of like give it you know make sure there's always something happening always something moving which is a great thing but sometimes it's a bit stagey um yeah, so this special effect here, they use this all of the time on the TV and... It was, wasn't it, Nick? Yeah, every every TV show had like a little bit about the film, the clips, or like something about special effects on some TV show, like Bad Influence. It will be that They'd show short. a tiny little bit of this and they'd show a tiny little bit of the T-Rex attack, but they didn't show you everything. So that when you went no. into the cinema, like the T-Rex attack was still... You, you, they showed like a quarter of the T-Rex attack and you felt like you'd seen yeah. it. Well, often it'd just, be, it'd just be his foot, wouldn't it? That'll be, that'll be it, his yeah. foot, when he steps in the mud, you know. Uh, it was, uh, but So this is one of those special effects where it was... Uh, I mean, I would say if you didn't have the trees near it, mm. it would feel... Obviously, the trees are there to sort of, like, blend it into the kind of environment, but, yeah. but you can sort of, like, see a bit of an outline around them now. But I would say up until about 10 years ago that those special effects sort of um, held held their own. Why why is that? Why is CGI... Uh, why, like, even I would say Jurassic Park, The Lost World, the special effects mm. haven't... didn't They didn't even seem as good when you were watching that for the first time at the cinema. Well, a lot of, the thing, a lot of these things now... There was obviously more, more ambition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at... Classic Park now, right? Because because we we're now watching these films in high definition. At the time, you would have watched it on thirty five millimeter. You would you would have, you know, if you've watched it multiple times, you may have seen those kind of rough edges. But seeing it on the f for that first experience, you don't see that because you watch it over and over again. And you watch it on VHS or you watch it on um, you know a DVD. That resolution is kind of lowered, so you don't really notice these things. Now on HD, you can kind of see the rough edges. Um, and like when the T-Rex comes out later on, when it's all raining, you look above him, it's kind of it looks quite low res where the rain is. But these things are all kind of, uh, at the time, mastered at that 2K resolution, which is kind of really high resolution for the time, but now that's like a Blu-ray resolution. So, um, you know, things are always... Watching it now with higher quality, you're always going to have this sort of, sort of degrade. Uh, over time, well, not over time, but just down to the technology itself. Um, Lost World, though, is certainly more ambitious with what they did. Yeah, there's, there's more, more shots. CGI in it. This only has about what? Is it about any six minutes of CGI in this film? Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was about thirteen, but I think yeah, maybe is it thirteen? Maybe, is it? No, I think you're right. It's there's it's there's much low. less CGI than than you think, but I think there's less dinosaur action. What, what sells it is Stan Winston stuff, isn't it? What, yeah. That's what sells it is the yeah. puppets. I mean, the puppets are so good that they match the CGI. 
Uh, except for the fact that the dinosaur, uh, I was going to say the dinosaur, the T Rex, um, the T Rex model uh, CGI model is slightly different from the animatronic model, where his eyebrows are different, mm. or her eyebrows are different. Apologies. I think it's, it appears a lot. Thi- I think it appears even thinner as in CG form. In like the puppet is a lot more fat. You know, it's like it's eating a house. It's yeah, like, but also um, uh, from that rainstorm scene. Um, the puppet mm. absorbed so much water. That's right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's some shots of it when it's on top of the car where its face looks quite fat, and I think, and it doesn't really match the CGI. It doesn't matter, I mean, it's nitpicking. And one of, so going back to the film that we're watching, I love this bit. I love how slow the build up is, I love how realistic it is it's like yeah if it was a real theme park it would be all of this stuff i love it Mm. and i remember at the time people were impatient and they were like saying when are all the dinosaurs going to show up and i remember i never had that problem i felt like i was completely invested Mm. um this is sort of it's stuff like this that reminds you of westworld in a way you know i was about to say that yeah because it is very much a sort of michael Crichton getting to revisit that sort of theme park idea and sort of, you know, improve upon it. Because there is... Westworld itself, you know, the, the new TV show, is I thought was incredible, like season one and two. Season three, I was a bit... I didn't finish. But um, but the original film was a great idea, and there's sort of... There's a few kind of mis, mishaps, mishaps with that. But I think this has kind of really improved that sort of idea about what you've created turns against you, essentially. Sure. And, um, and obviously wonderfully parodied in, like, Simpsons, you know, with Itching Scratchy Land. Yeah. You know? Um, but this is like this sequence here as you were saying I think it's so effective because it, it really simplifies what they're doing and how they're sort of using the dino DNA and combining it with the with the frog's DNA and it's just like it's like a very simple educational video which is entertaining and doesn't drag at all it's an in-universe way of explaining what the fuck is going on with the film um, yeah and uh, and it's the sort of thing that you would exactly see at a theme park and I think I think it's just Excellent filmmaking, like all of this stuff. It's kind of, you know, it, it, he's basically filmed a fake documentary about how dinosaurs are made, and I think he, he must have he must have had so much fun doing that. Um, <laughs> it's such a fun idea, you know. It's like an in-universe documentary that they're all watching. I find all of this just so entertaining and fun and. Because in the book, because in the book, it's a bit more heavy-handed, isn't it? With the yeah, with how they sort of go about it, and there's even like DNA diagrams. It's like computer code they have, and yeah, all this stuff. It's always a bit, it's a bit strange, you know. Yeah, if you try and read any of his books, you know, um, they're sort of like that. Uh, Congo is so heavy on the science, and but is the book better than the film? The film, I thought the film was so stupid. I think well, I this is that, that's an impossible. You know, that's an impossible <laughs> question to answer. Um, <laughs> but, like, Rising Sun is like that, and Disclosure is like that. Disclosure is all science. Um, and uh, and Jurassic Park is, is slightly science-heavy, but, you know, it's, it's a perfect kind of match. They've made it simple for kids to enjoy, haven't they? For anyone to enjoy. I, don't, I, don't, I think that kids, kids get it, but it really sells it to just anyone that's there. And and you're not really, um, you know, you know it's for entertainment purposes. So they haven't gone into like huge detail, you know. Um, and in the, in universe, it's for entertainment pur- purposes. So they haven't gone into huge detail. So you kind of like you're vaguely interested in science, but what you really want is the dinosaurs to attack. And so it kind of like does that middle middle ground of kind of like tells the story of the film. It sells the thing. Well, that's the same thing with the sequels, wasn't it? Because I think once you've kind of seen the dinosaurs, you want to kind of, I think, well, the mentality is like to show more of them and have more action. But I always like, even things like Lost World, I, I like things to sort of play out slowly at the beginning because that's the most exciting part I find is the build up. And then two, you get the, the escape. Right, because once they've kind of blown their load too early, they have to sort of think of different ways for the dinosaurs to attack. It just becomes a, a, a chase movie. Yeah, um, and that, you, you kind of lose that momentum. You, it's difficult to repeat that. When you look um, at something like Congo, you realise that it's ninety-five percent build-up. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> the best it's, part is the laser gun bit. Or this Bruce Campbell at the beginning. That's the best bit. Yeah. The whole film should be about Bruce Campbell. Well, the whole film should have been about Bruce Campbell. And he's in it at the beginning. And then a young kid who took his whole family to see Congo because he recognised Bruce Campbell in the trailer. Uh, you have like a very disappointing end to that to that yeah. character arc. Um, should have continued on from Army of Darkness. He wakes up there. Oh, what's that too long? It's all these apes everywhere. It was so. It was so. Mate, it was so such a missed opportunity because you think you've got Bruce Campbell. Why? Are, why isn't he the lead? This is exactly. Why isn't he the lead? Why? Were, oh God! It's, it's one of the most fr- frustrating careers because you just think, just put him yeah, in yeah. everything. Put him in everything. <laughs> uh, it's just no. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, like all of this stuff. I mean, you kind of know this is the, in a weird way. It's, it's realistic, and they sell it as a character and everything like that. But this is almost like the most puppety that they get. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah because it's, it's it's a little bit too kind of like a little bit stiff and stuff but it, but you, you completely buy into it which is kind of you know it works and what I think is such amazing casting is Richard Attenborough as John Hammond you know because his brother you know so famously David you know right. like the the go to guy to about anything about the world and animals and so forth and uh, and his voice you know his his voice really kind of just adds an extra layer of warmth to the movie yeah and. Uh, it's a shame he kind of rolls sort of, sort of, you know, come Lost World, he kind of, you know, took a step back. But um, he was kind of, it's a shame in the, in the book, you know, he dies. And all these people, like Jeff Goldblum dies in the book and like he, they bring him back for the sequel, you know. Well, in the book, he's, um, in the book, Hammond is the proper bad guy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's kind of, we, yeah, I, I didn't even get his proper bad guy. I just felt he was a bit more, yeah, he's more kind of a, Self-obsessed, I think. I don't he think would. he really cares about his grandkids, and um, mm. and he's all business-minded. Th- he's he's like a villain in the, in in the uh, I think in the book, and in the, and in the film, they've kind of gone. Oh, he's he's going to be Santa Claus in a year. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like <laughs> he he sells he sells that character that he kind of um, he. He's the downfall of his own kind of ambition, ambition, but not yeah, in a, yeah. but in a, in a, in a, in a kind of sweet way that he just wanted to, entertain. Yeah, 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 just wants to entertain people, you know. Yeah, exactly. He's gone from fleas to dinosaurs, you know. Absolutely, but this time the dinosaurs are real. <laughs> uh, of <Exactly>. course, <laughs> I don't think that's a quote, but it, it should be. It should be somewhere in there. At the time, like the, the facts about raptors, raptors were a lot smaller, weren't they, in reality? Raptors are like the size of turkeys. <laughs> that's, that's the, that's, is that in the film or is that? No, I don't think they, I don't, I don't, I don't think they sort of, uh, I think Ra- it's maybe behind the scenes stuff. They may have alluded to that and said, hey, look, we kind of made them bigger as a sort of, sort of the new sort of bad guys. Well, no one had known, no one knew what a raptor was. And before Jurassic Park, a Tyrannosaurus Rex was a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And mm. then afterwards it was a T-Rex. You know, yeah. no one, I, I just, I remember kind of, and no one really knew what a raptor was because they had sort of taken these, it's sort of very much what they did with uh, Iron Man when Marvel started making movies. They took like a lesser known B character and they gave him A-list uh, status. And uh, that's what they did with raptors. No one really knew what raptors were. They were f- feathered uh, turkey-sized um, predators. Uh, and then they sort of like beefed them up a bit. I guess... If anything, it allowed uh, stunt performers to get inside the raptor suits, you know, on a practical level. Did you see some of the, um, you know, the the uh, the early sort of go motion stuff filter yeah, that did that it's he was great. Able to do for the film? It's really cool, isn't it? I, I, it's it great. Would have, it, it showed you, even though, like, you know, once they saw that demonstration of the T Rex walking through their sort of, you know, through the to this kind of piece of land uh, they he knew he was his career was up because it this was so much more smoother and it looked yeah. real compared to the guy motion stuff as always i as an extra level a lot of creepiness to it like it's like ed 209 or kane in robocop 2 it, it, it looks glorious but it's just like it way it moves it kind of adds a level of kind of like 
I don't know. Makes it very strange to sort of see it, but in a good way. It does a it does a know. different thing. It does a different thing. Yeah. Um, it's a different uh, way of doing something similar. Um, uh, I love um, stop motion and go motion. Um, I think it adds to characters like Ed Two Hundred Nine, where it's meant to be robotic, and uh, it's. I think I I think it actually goes towards selling a character like that. Um, with Jurassic Park, uh, they probably could have done go motion and got away with it for the first one, but it was all about, um, you know, uh, it, progressing the technology as well. Mm. Um, and I think Spielberg was kind of like, and also Spielberg is friends with George Lucas, and George Lucas is waiting for technology to advance to the point that he can do his Star Wars prequels. So, it's, <laughs> it, 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 and James Cameron would have been kind of like pushing it. So all of that group of filmmakers, they're all kind of like got their finger on the pulse of technology, and they're not just sort of thinking about what the film is that they are making currently, but they are thinking about how to. Inc- how to how to progress filmmaking as an art form so in having a mega budget movie like Jurassic Park it's almost Spielberg's responsibility to go with what's new and cutting edge because 20 years down the line we'll be seeing the benefits of that um oh yeah so so I think Go Motion had sort of had its day by that point I love it I love it and I think that it's a shame that um it's not used uh, at all, really, anymore. Well, so I suppose this sort of go motion thing. I suppose different to stop motion, isn't it? With the um, well, go motion. Obviously, Tim Burton continued it with, uh, and obviously um, Ardman, you know. But well, yeah, so stop they motion sort of deployed as kids films. Stop you know? motion is sort of like a style of animation, um, and I think mm. because you're dealing with cartoon characters, largely, uh, it doesn't matter about how realistic it is. Because you still no. you could still you know completely invest yourself into two D animation, and stop motion, go motion. That's where there's sort of like it, it vibrates, doesn't it? And there's there's a motion blur on on the on the model. And but go motion, stop motion. I grew up loving Ray Harryhausen, and um, and watching the original King Kong movie, and uh, and that's what that's what this is trying to sort of like. Um, okay, um, so this scene here, there's no dinosaurs in it. It's four adults sat around a table, eating dinner, having a conversation. It's one of the best scenes in the film. Yeah, absolutely love it. I mean, because, yeah, it's just a... It's an incredible scene. It's, it's it, All the, the bright minds coming together to sort of say, is this ethical? Yeah, it's got... It's a really great way of getting across... Uh, the ethics of what they're doing in the film, but also each character has a point of view. And uh, and this is a great scene where each character gets to express their point of view around the table. And you see the disappointment in Richard Hammond that his experts aren't on, on, on his side. Um, you see Alan kind of... Um, uh, weighing it up and listening and then he sort of comes to sort of like a conclusion by the end of it it's yeah i th- i think it's it's a, it's a great scene it holds up to you know th- they don't do that really in films where they just go hey we've got a film where it's about dinosaurs that break loose from their enclosures and eat human beings and you know however far we are half an hour into the film we're going to stop everything and they're going to have dinner and they're just going to have a chat in a black room. And it's one of the best things in the film. I love the bit with uh, with Ellie where she says, you know, you've got plants in here which are, you, you've put just because they look great, because but they're poisonous, you know what I mean? And it's just like these sort of little touches around, like even the idea of being about dinosaurs, they've got plants there which are kind of poisonous and he's kind of oblivious to it all, thinking this is all just a big show. Yeah. And the experts who obsess over dinosaurs and they'll come to the conclusion that this is a mistake bringing them back. It's like the one thing that you guys, why he's so like shocked is like the ones that would be on his side are like, this is not a good idea. Um, it's like, uh, I think even today, if, if the opportunity came about to actually bring back dinosaurs, I think the experts would be like, nah, it's probably not a good idea. 
you know, I don't know. Maybe I they know. have secretly, Nick, in, in somewhere in like Area 51, they've got a T-Rex sitting there. <laughs> I, th- I don't think it's that far away from, um, from reality. Do you know what I mean? I don't mean that they're going to build dinosaurs. When this came out, wasn't it? Like there were shows constantly on TV, like Channel 4, whatever, saying, oh, this is new information. We're going to bring back dinosaurs like, like Jurassic Park with the DNA, the richest, blah, 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 blah. The richest people in the world are pouring all of their money into... Uh, building spaceships so that the super elite and rich can go out into outer space for 45 minutes 15 minutes however long you know that's that's the thing that's happening that's kind of that they're trying to commercialize outer space uh they're not spending the money on uh making the planet you know better for a large majority of people they're doing it on entertainment and mm. i th- i think that when you look at what's happening now with all of that stuff and you look at Jurassic Park, it's almost the exact same thing. Mm. Do you think Jeff Bezos is going to bring back dinosaurs then? <laughs> I mean, if, they te- if the technology was there, they would be in a race to do that. Don't yeah, you think? Yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I, I suppose if someone cracked it and it wasn't particularly perfect, then that race would kick off to get that, you know... Who can be the one to create the perfect dinosaur? But the clever thing, wasn't it, in Jurassic World, was that they created the dinosaurs to look a specific way, not the way they originally were supposed to be, like with feathers and stuff, you know, or, you know and hair. I think that's bullshit, um, to be honest. That's, uh, I mean... What, you want to see a big fluffy uh, T-Rex? I mean, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> this scene's great. This scene's great. Just, this is it, great, is he? It's one <laughs> shot. He hates kids. And he hates kids. And you, you just... And Sam Neill, Blake, I mean, you know... It, would it have been better if Harrison Ford was in it? He's it, Harrison Ford is like the king of being grumpy, you know. Um, and But, yeah, I mean... I feel like at the time, Sam Neill was like, like in this film, because he'd made like films like Dead Calm and adult grown-up films, Possession, yeah, yeah. Uh, films that I. This was my first introduction to Sam Neill. I think so too. I I I don't think I'd seen things like you know the Omen Three at that point. He was sort of like Diet Harrison Ford in this, where it's kind of like, where's Harrison Ford? (laughs) You've got him wearing a hat, but that ain't Harrison Ford. And then when you actually look back at his career, this is sort of like the anomaly where he's playing a good guy. Everything else, yeah, he's like he's playing these vicious. Was it the following year he did uh, In the Mouth of Madness, didn't he? And then Um, the year after, or like a couple of years after that, was Event Horizon. Um, yeah, great uh, villain in that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you won't need eyes where we, where you're going. He was the bad guy yeah. in Memoirs of the Invisible Man. Um, Shit, yeah. But also, the, 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 throwing in the kids and having their relationship with with uh, Alan Grant is classic Spielberg. You know what I mean? The kids are, yeah, you know, are, are, are directed extremely well. And I love the sort of the the arc of his character where he hates children, doesn't want them, not interested. By the end, he becomes this kind of surrogate father, father to him. He's looking after them and keeping them, you know, entertained or trying to keep their spirits up when, you know, they're, they're just being terrified. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll stay awake all night and look after you. You know, I won't go to sleep. So that's it, just like, oh, wonderful. It you know? happens really sort of like naturally as well. So you've got the, yeah. there with the lawyer, Gennaro, who had previously been in Stop and My Mum Will Shoot. Um... <laughs> And <laughs> a cinematic marvel. And he's meant to be looking after them in that car because there's no danger. It doesn't really matter they're in the car. Later on, when um, they get attacked by the T Rex um, and he abandons them, it's not like Sam Neill is sort of like going, Oh, I've got to look after these, I should look after these kids because that's my role. I'm going to be a father figure to them. It's literally, he has to. He's the only person that can protect these kids in this situation, so he goes to do that. It's sort of like the responsibility of becoming kind of like this parent to these kids throughout the film sort of happens very gradually, and uh, it's just sold really well. It's that little moment there where they try to spot that dinosaur, it's not there. It's like the classic time you go to any zoo and they've got like they've got lions or tigers, and you go, where are they? It's great. <laughs> like they're all asleep, hidden away. It's know. great because it makes you, as an audience, as well, you can relate to it, and but you're also frustrated because you're like going, "Where are the dinosaurs? When are we going to see <laughs> these? Sake. When are we going to see these dinosaurs?" <laughs> and then when you do get to see them, it's terrifying, 
and you kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah. be careful what you wish for do you know the film mm -hmm. is sort of like teaching you lessons like that as well so at the moment he's dressed up as uh cory feldman <laughs> from uh from the goonies with his gray coat and then he puts on the yellow mac uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, when he puts on the Yellow Mac, he's Sean Astin. The old Apple Macs they're using. Yes. I, I, I do love that computer room. I, I just love the production design. The little, even this when they, they sit, go through that sort of sit in the chairs and watch the, the show about the DNA. I just, it just kind of re also reminds me of kind of this visual elements of the early 90s. Just how things were kind of represented with computers or just like. So the use of grey, there's a lot of grey kind of used, isn't there? Yeah, sort but it's, it's industrial, kind of computer isn't room. it? It's, yeah, they're basically yeah. it in a concrete... It works, it's sort of nostalgic way for me. Everything's made out of concrete and it's concrete bunkers and stuff like that. And um, and it's it's designed because it's a zoo. The, it's a practical thing. They haven't kind of like gone over the top. Like these, like everything is so sort of like real world. Like I... Absolutely. What sells the dinosaurs is the fact that these Jeeps look so good, you know? It's kind of like yeah, yeah. the company that built the dinosaurs are building this attraction for families to come along to, and the Jeeps are perfect for it. Um, and the, the observation centre, that's perfect. And the computer room, is there's nothing to make that look like a theme park. It just looks like a boring concrete computer room because that's what it is. Um, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Also, the car can be, made, can be made into a toy. So it's, you know, all this, like, it, just how colourful it is. A kid will like, I want that. <laughs> Even though it's just a normal vehicle. Yeah. It has no guns with it. But but to be honest, you know, I had dinosaur toys when I was growing up and I never thought that the Jurassic Park toys um, were that great. Um, Do you remember the T-Rex had like a bit of meat that come out of its, yeah. of its side? Yeah. And there was the big place there. They were sort of like dino, Park as well. dino damage uh, toys. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like those old He-Man figures with like damage on his chest and spin around. As know. much as the as much as the marketing kind of like um and and the merchandise for, for this film sort of like took off, it was everywhere. It was impossible to go anywhere without Well it's like as you were saying, like it, 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 like earlier on they 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 held back on showing you the dinosaurs. The teasers didn't show you that much. The poster, very much like the Batman poster, black logo. Yeah. That was it. It's the film's logo, but it's also the park's logo, yeah. um, and I guess it's go, it, it you know it follows a long line of logos, isn't it? You know, Ghostbusters, yeah. uh, that was that was sold on a logo, yeah. Um, but it's sort of it's selling you the concept of the park. You know, if you didn't believe all of this stuff that was going on right now, you're not going to believe mm. the dinosaurs. No, no. I do, I do love that keyboard. I just had that keyboard. My dad did. Super clicky. Yeah. Everyone, buy, everyone buys those clicky keyboards now, don't they? Yeah, they're brilliant. Yeah. It feels like you're actually doing work. <laughs> when you get a laptop and they're just sort of like flush buttons and you don't feel like you're doing anything. <laughs> oh, the 90s. Was that the best decade? See... We both grew up in the nineties, but people look. I didn't. I was born in eighty two, but I didn't really experience the eighties. Really, you weren't really aware of what's going on till about six or seven. So my, I'm very much nineties. But I think back at some of the, the the music and what was on TV, and I kind of hated it. And some of it I look back now with some nostalgia. But I think for me, it was just kind of movies and video games were kind of like fine. And being in that sort of Britpop era and seeing Spice Girls, I was just like, Ugh! You know, I I I kind of hated it. Yeah. Um, but I loved, I loved all the sort of new metal stuff. I was going for that grumpy teenager phase, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I loved all things like Faith No More and Corn and things like that. I loved all that. I thought, I thought the 80s was good for sort of like, when you look back on it, for horror movies. The horror movies in the 80s and genre movies in the 80s were great. But I think I loved blockbusters in the 90s. And I also think that Rocky, uh, Rocky movies aside, I think the 90s... 
that's when I started going to the cinema and going. Yeah, also cinemas were had, had really made an effort to clean up because the eighties were kind of known for the flea pit cinemas and. Yeah, like, well, then you got like the multiplexes. And uh, yeah, yes. and uh, I think Jurassic Park was maybe one of the first films. Went to see it in Hatfield at the uh, UCI in in the in the Galleria in Hatfield, and mm. um, the Galleria, was, <laughs> the Galleria. Uh, that was like one of the first one of the first. Films. I think I'd seen Adam's Family there, but it was sort of like it was a special treat to go out to Hatfield to watch. Um, this watch was the film that made use of the new sound technology of DTS. So it was just like this. Uh, when I worked as a projectionist, the DTS would come on a CD. So uh, in the rack, you have all the amplifiers, the Dolby processor, and you have to be a DTS one. Uh, DTS one, the CD would go in, and the CD would sync with the printed uh, sound on the on the film, 35, 35 millimeter film. Um, so I mean, Dolby Digital didn't do that. It was just kind of read off the film itself, but. DTS had a separate CD, and that was kind of really blew people away at the time. And it was like everyone had to see Jurassic Park and DTS because it really kind of rocked the cinema. Right. And uh, everyone was desperate to get the DTS when it came out on Laserdisc, and then it was also the DVDs. Now, everything has DTS now, but at the time it was kind of like revolutionary, kind of the next step in sound. And that year, also, Last Action Hero. That's another kind of strange thing, wasn't it? Because Last Action Hero was kind of tutored as kind of being this massive hit, and it was kind of its box office was kind of destroyed by Jurassic Park because everyone went to see Jurassic Park week on, week out. You know, the kids would go back on a regular basis um, where Arnold said, look, we've got to delay Last Action Hero because Jurassic Park's going to be massive. And they're like, Sonny were like, no, 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 it's fine. Should have delayed it by a couple of, by a couple of months and he would have been all right. But couple kind of, of, was, uh, A couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> the box office was kind of uh, messed up by this film. It was like E.T. back in 82. That was kind of dominating box office. It's Spielberg doing a genre movie. Uh, I mean, he's he's great at this sort of stuff. Um, is this the scene? So there's there's a subplot. Big massive pile of shit. There's some there's a subplot that's cut out of this bit. That um, there's a, there's a shot that comes up where they're holding these stones that um, that have come out of. Is it deleted scene? It's, it's a little scene or a subplot. It's like they leave Ellie with the, with the Triceratops, and um, they find out that it's. I guess you get. I, I can't really remember any of what I'm talking about right now. That's um, <laughs> that's the producer, isn't it? Um, well, one of the producers is Frank Marshall, but that's not. He's, that that guy's too old. It's not Frank Marshall, surely. No. The director of Congo. And arachnophobia. Oh. Yes. He's only masterpiece. <laughs> Which I've not seen in years because I hate fucking hate spiders. I think this guy is one of the... Um, I've not... Yeah. Do you know what? I, I'm pretty sure that arachnophobia is what introduced me to being arachnophobic. Because I don't think I had a problem watching <laughs> it the first time. And then s- s- shortly after seeing, uh, seeing arachnophobia, I started... Um, Becoming terrified of spiders, and I still. <laughs> well, that's what, for me with Jaws. Seeing it as a, a young age, I was six years old, seeing a guy get eaten at the end. That was I was there. Uh, I was kind of terrified to get in the pool. You know, I, I, I'm not a great swimmer. I could swim about a length, and I'm kind of useless. But it's the bit when they kill. <laughs> it's a bit. It's the bit when they kill the kid on the lilo, and um, mm. you, you're not sure what you've seen. Yeah, and yeah. It, that's absolutely terrifying. Perhaps there's not like enough moments like that. I think that in terms of repeat viewing, you know, you need to really be invested in these characters, and I think the characters are slightly there's not necessary enough meat on them. You know, um, I mean, so also, also interesting. Like Samuel Jackson was kind of just a. You know, sort of getting supporting roles at that point was it? I think it was Pulp Fiction that really sort of catapulted his career, wasn't it? Was yeah, it? he was in Goodfellas yeah, very yeah. briefly, um, and then he auditioned for Reservoir Dogs, uh, but didn't get the part because he thought it was a read through rather than an audition. He thought he was reading in, and uh, 
and so he didn't he didn't do it. And then um, later on, he auditioned for Pulp Fiction, and he got that. And then he's Samuel L. Jackson. But when you look back on it, you kind of like go, God, even the supporting cast is filled with kind of. But it's not a huge cast. It's not. No, it's not. You know, um, I always think that. I, I know later on they they keep like saying people are dying and um, and I think my mum at the time was like well who there's like eight people on the island, I always uh, thought that the implication was that it is a skeleton crew Some of, of the people, staff have eaten or something. but there yeah. are staff that are out there that are kind of helping mm. get the get the show but on. Most the of them leave, don't they? Most of them leave on the boat. Like that's where you know. Newman is supposed to be getting to, you know, uh, he's too late. But yeah, it was a bit yes. As in the in the context of the book, yeah, she, the, the line, "There's people dying out there," whatever. That is kind of yeah, quite justly so. But in the film, yeah, the lawyers died, who no one gave a shit about. No, know? but I always got the implication that there are other people on the island. We're just not following mm. their story. Um, yeah. Yeah, I never. Th- those things didn't bother me. I just assumed that people were actually getting killed. <laughs> That's a good prop, isn't it? That is, isn't it? Do you think he got to keep it? I think he did. Because he was... um. A friend of mine knows uh, new uh, Richard Attenborough. He was, he was he was in an old people's home for quite a while before he passed away. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I think in the mid two thousands, I think. And because um, he yeah, because he did a few more films and he kind of just sort of bowed out, you know. Well, he was very old. Oh yeah, of course. And he'd been around for really. absolutely. I mean, he was in The Great Escape. He'd. This, it's this, crazy, yeah. rather than this being his introduction to the world, and introducing mm. Richard Attenborough, this was sort of like his brief sort of mid nineties curtain call, where he came out and yeah, yeah, he did yeah. some absolutely you know um, huge childhood staples, and then he disappeared again. Mm. But yeah, was well, he directed um, Chaplin, didn't he? Like I think a couple of years before this, or was it around the same time? He did that. Like he did that. He also did that. Um, uh, Pierce Brosnan, is it Grey Owl? Pierce Brosnan Native American movie. Uh, this this is great. You know, in the classic sense of casting people, you get you get new faces, you get kind of like actors who are well established, you know, in the middle age, and then you get someone who's a veteran, the sort of, you know fill out the the, you know, the cast of characters. Yes, yes. But what I would say is that um, this is a very 90s movie. You look at something like Jaws and um, there's so much going on underneath, no pun intended, underneath the surface, you know. It's kind of like those three actors, there's so much going on between those guys. Um and with this, this feels slightly more um, lightweight, more cartoony. Um, you know, you've got villains and 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 good guys, and um, it's not really aiming. It's kind of weird because because Jaws invented the blockbuster, the modern blockbuster, and then Jurassic Park was you know almost twenty years later, and. And there's some things that are, are, are the same and there's some things that are different. And I think that there's a lot less depth to this film than there is to Jaws. And and I would say that was one of the things that I would strike against Jurassic Park. It is a fun thrill ride. I bloody love it. But because these characters aren't particularly deep, you... There's, you and you can and you know the shark is barely in Jaws and you I just love those three characters so much I love all the characters in Jaws, and I feel like every single actor brings so much sort of weight and baggage to each part that they're playing, and 
you know, you're just watching fireworks every time you have two of those actors on screen together. Whereas with this, it's kind of like, well, we need this scene to explain what's going to happen later. And, you know, as great as Richard Attenborough, Jurassic Park, and uh, what's his name? Peck, what's his name? Is it Walter Peck? No, not, is it Walter Peck? No, it's not. It's not Walter Peck. It's, um, what's his face? The clever girl guy but you have those three actors and it's kind of like they're not bringing much more to it than than what's required is it robert muldoon is it is uh robert muldoon is played by a guy called something peck no that's that's the well, that's the that's the actor's name robert muldoon yeah. but yeah he, he passed away in 1999 you know he was in the I saw this film years ago called um, oh, what was it? It was produced by Gary Kurtz and it starred Mark, starred Mark Hamill. It was um, it's not Split Second. It was um, oh, it'll come back to me. It was a massive bomb in like 1989, but um, he popped up in a few things. Starred Mark Hamill, and it wasn't a massive hit no slipstream it was called it's called it's called slipstream that was it slipstream i've seen slipstream fucking hell that came out in the video shop yeah i've seen that was it mark hamill with ble- bleach blonde hair was that the film yeah that's right yeah yeah the post is really cool but the, and the trailer kind of sells something that's like quite interesting when you watch it it's like oh it's a bit of a bore fest but yes yeah, it completely bombed yeah sure difficult to get hold of um muldoon is played by bob peck he was a British TV actor, and then he died. But I haven't really seen him in anything else. I love the lighting in here. It feels like, you know, the war room. It feels like I love the storm. As you're comparing it sort of to sort of you know with Jaws and so forth, with being sort of somewhat sort of similar sort of kind of style, I think it's certainly more of a sort of streamlined, stripped down version of of Jaws, I would say. And um, you know, because as you say, the characters aren't as deep as the ones in Jaws. You know, um, it's a little bit more. There's a little bit more kind of uh, things are simplified, and it's it's you think it may be a result of David Kep. He's kind of script. I mean, as a screenwriter, he he was popping out so many scripts during the nineties, and he obviously contributed to Spider Man, The Shadow, um, some of the stuff. I think his, his stuff he he wrote was never bad, but it was never really amazing. It was always this kind of like straight down the middle. It was kind of like, yeah. I mean, if if the directions kind of kind of suck, then the, the, his scripts are not going to work. But um, in the case of this, I mean, hmm. Crichton and Kett kind of works on it, so it's, that was that was kind of interesting. That. Kept, Crichton would stream, would change a lot of his own story. But, I mean, he was a filmmaker, you know? Yeah, it's true, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. At the same time as, as Spielberg was finding his feet, Michael Crichton yeah. was making... Westworld, didn't he, so... Westworld, um, the f- first great train robbery. Did he do the and- the Andromeda Strain? Did he do that? Andromeda Strain, yeah. That's a good film. So like he that. was he was kind of making those those films in the seventies. Coma. I suppose inherently he kind of knew what would what would work and what wouldn't work with his sort of ad- ad- adapting his own stories. I don't think he directed Coma, but that was a Michael Douglas movie. Um, so yeah, brilliant. How was this done, Ollie? What this sequence here? Yeah, how was how were the cups done? <laughs> oh, it was, it was a vibration, wasn't it? Of the guitar, wasn't it? Or sort of a bass. They had a guitar string underneath the underneath the thing, which is weird. You think super clever, but surely there was another way of doing that. Surely you just bang the <laughs> yeah, bang the. Yeah. Did anybody try banging the dashboard? This was the scene where they yeah. used it on Blue Peter and. <laughs> It's just everything. It's on news like, oh, it's a, and and there was there was an edit point because you know he was wearing this at one point, and then the next thing you know, that's not there. You know they just they hacked this to pieces to so that there was some sort of thing to get you into the cinema. But when you watch it, it was all filled out, and there were these scenes. Oh wow, that that scene wasn't in it. That that is 
Oh my God, what an amazing sequence this is. <laughs> and it's great because you've waited an hour for this. You've waited an yeah, hour and then all of a sudden you get it. To get into it. Just when you yeah. think that you're not going to see anything, you see everything. But see, he's got a slightly fatter <laughs> head than the CGI <laughs> model. So where's to go? <laughs> Yeah, he's got a fatter head, hasn't he? Yeah. As I, I always find it kind of a little bit strange where they, the idea of that, if you don't move, the T-Rex couldn't see you. So how do they sort of determine that? Who, who kind of thought that was the case? You know, you just, And they found just... out almost immediately, it, they found out almost immediately that it was incorrect. So in the sequel, they sort of like say, oh, yeah, that's not true. And it's like, well, then it still was true in the first film, though, right? When you were all staying yeah. still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, it's so good. It's when he steps out. The rain out. really sells it. Yeah. And the rain was like a last minute addition. He, you know, he said it should be raining. It's just also That like, sounds the... bollocks, right? That sounds bollocks, right? The whole film is set during a no, storm. No, that can't be a last-minute edition. Because that, yeah, because it's all set in the rain. This whole sequence. But, then, but, but that's what the story is now, isn't it? Is that Spielberg said, oh, we want it to be raining. And yeah. then they were like, but we haven't, built the, we haven't built the machine. We haven't built the Tyrannosaurus Rex for rain because it's not waterproof. So all of the foam absorbed and it put on like two tonne in weight so that it was like it was heavier than it was designed to be. And then... Um, and then when they left it alone, uh, in between takes and in between, you know, uh, shots and stuff, the Tyrannosaurus Rex would move spontaneously by itself. God, that would creep you out, wouldn't it? Which is just absolutely fucking terrifying. <laughs> and it would kill you. They said people had to just, like, they had to not let anyone go near it, because if it, if it fell on you, it would literally, you know, kill you. Well, all the rain made it malfunction. Yeah. Yeah, just absolutely. Oh, I mean, the sound of the T Rex. I mean, that's just like it, you can't imagine it sounding any different. You know, when they when you no. have dinosaurs in other programs like the BBC did those documentaries about dinosaurs. You see other movies kind of deploy them when they kind of roar. If it doesn't sound the same, it's not a T Rex. They roar like lions. They roar like yeah. lions, and uh, this is just incredible. And it's it is it's it's a horror movie, but it, I would say that Jurassic Park was a film that was made for children and families, whereas Jaws was like a seventies movie that was filled with character actors. Still, it's film for adults. And it wasn't. Yeah, it's the, the kids can watch it, sure, but it's not a kids' film. Whereas I would say this is more of a kids' film. Well, nowadays, you know, as we saw during the 90s, they'd still make big, expensive movies for adults, but kids could, you know, teenagers could go and see it and enjoy it. Um, but now, as we saw recently with, like, Ridley Scott's The Last Duel, which is kind of 18 certificate kind of movie, massive budget, the adults weren't going to see it, you know. And they just started playing, well, now you have to kind of make films nowadays for kids and teenagers and it has to be a 12 well, really to sort of that sweet well, spot you, which I you know it's a shame yeah but also I mean how many superhero films do do well do they is there a market for that I don't I don't I don't really know um, I, I I go to the cinema to just watch whatever I want to see and mm. I'm not really um, I'm not really swayed by uh box office but I know people are obsessed with box office now because it's it's, well, so it's, like, it's, a, it's, it's a barometer it's like, of success and if the movie's good or bad but that doesn't really that's not always the case it's yeah. like it's like sport now you know with you know the Marvel and DC thing is kind of like oh well, well we beat you at the box office and mm. it's kind of I've never I've never really sort of like subscribed but the, the, the film success and how good it is, is it, 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 to me is my opinion is always like does it work in five or ten years' time? It doesn't. It was just like at that point, it was kind of, yeah, everyone went to see it, everyone kind of raved about it, and people forget about it. You know I mean, it's, it's a bit like the Oscars when the, the films that win, no one ever remembers. It's the ones that didn't, the ones that lost, that continue to be talked about, you know. Right. 
Well, I always found that I didn't know that a film was a flop until after I'd years later i didn't know oh, that yeah. last action hero was a massive flop until much later on i just saw it at the cinema i really enjoyed it um and i went to see Jurassic park a lot I, last action hero was a 15 so i was 12 last action hero was a 15 i so i snuck into the cinema to see that with my family but i wouldn't have been able to get in by myself so i only saw that once at the cinema uh Jurassic park was a pg Went to see this twice, and then there was birthday parties where they'd all get taken to Jurassic Park. So I must have seen this about four or five times at the cinema. <laughs> then it came out on VHS, and it was like, it was like later on there was Independence Day, which was one of those films. That was another big event movie, wasn't it? With uh, yeah, and it's and it was. Um... <sighs> Well, that, that, was, that was also at the time when, you know, on TV, everyone was kind of raving about the X-Files. You had sightings, TV shows, these kind of things. Everything kind of, you know, on TV was about UFOs and, and sightings about seeing them and having this kind of big budget kind of sci-fi movie, very much like War of the Worlds, come out. That was kind of a perfect timing. And it was a Fox movie and Fox owned X-Files, you know, so they knew what, to, what, what you know, what audiences were into. But there weren't loads of blockbusters, is, is sort of my point, was that Jurassic Park was the summer movie. It wasn't like, oh, and then there'll be another one like a couple of weeks down the, down the road. It was like Jurassic Park, and then when it came out on video, you just watched it like 20, 30, 40 times through osmosis, because every time we went to a birthday party or something, Jurassic Park was on in the background. And then a couple of years later, it was the same as with Independence Day. I saw that twice at the cinema, I think. And then just I was sick to fucking death of it by the end of it, because <laughs> every time... Like, like if, if the teacher wasn't there at school, someone would whack Independence Day in. And it's like, I ended up seeing that like 50 times. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that I like I enjoyed Independence Day the first one and a half times I watched it, and then after that I was like, oh, "All right, okay." Hmm? Um, whereas I think there is, you know, well, Jurassic Park you can put on every like you know probably like twice a year and still like you know still enjoy it for what it is. It doesn't it won't doesn't outstay its welcome, and it's you know out of all of them, you know what I mean. I I really struggle to sit through Lost World. I find number three more entertaining because it's shorter and there's more action to it, it despite having a terrible ending. Um, I like three. I yeah. think three... I'm fascinated by the career of uh, Joe Johnston. Yeah, me too, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's had so many sort of, like, absolute uh, uh, production disasters. Well, Wolfman being one of them, wasn't it? Wolfman. I want to know what happened with Wolfman. Um <laughs> I'm friends with Gemma Whelan, who's in Wolfman. Oh, right. Did you quiz her on that? Well, uh, she's in 90% of the film, but she's just never on screen. Like, there's what? a funeral There's a funeral scene, and she was in the horse-drawn carriage. You don't see her, but she was paid to sit inside a horse-drawn carriage for, like, a week. And it's oh kind of like, God. wow. There's, like, so much of Wolfman that changed. And it's kind of like, just tell me all about it. Um... You know, there was like the bit when he's doing Hamlet at the beginning of Wolfman, and he really did it, but he hadn't learnt it properly or something, and so they they did it as a montage rather than a thing. It's kind of like, what the fuck went wrong with Wolfman? I love Wolfman. <laughs> but actually, Joe did like Jumanji, didn't he? Did like The Rocketeer, did... Uh, Jumanji, you know, Rocketeer, he... Uh, I shot the kids. Captain America. Yeah. I mean, he does a certain thing. I mean, he's not even... But he's more like... Hmm... He do, he doesn't really hit the heights of someone like Spielberg. He's a bit more like a Joe Dante, maybe. Um, although Joe Dante's got like that Warner Brothers energy to him. Well, he's got he's just got the sort of mad sort of he's in love with the fifties. You know what I mean? Everything's going to be like a nostalgic trip to that sort of time. Uh, Joe Johnson is kind of like another guy who gets deployed to do these kind of very. A specific kind of like special effects movies, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, but so yeah, this bit's terrifying, and also, what's great about Dennis Nedry is that he is a bad guy, and he's sort of hissable, but you don't want him to die. So it's kind of like one of those. It's one of those. Um, 
kind of have your cake and eat it kind of deaths where it's yeah, kind of like yeah. you still you're still there kind of like going come on you can do it you're not really relishing it he sort of deserves it i still have the i love the still have the moment where samuel jackson goes to his desk to newman's desk and just goes what a complete slop <laughs> he's like he pushes all the shit <laughs> off the thing but he's just always after more money isn't he that's always after he's kind of you know and even him, he has a little that little argument with Hammond about his pay. He goes, you know, this is not my problem. You know, this is your, I don't, this is your finances, whatever. It's a, it's a very sort of human level discussion. And he tells him off, he just goes, thanks, Dad. You know, that's sort of a little quip he throws in. Yeah, but you get the feeling he's not evil. He's just trying to sort his money out. This is, this is, this is a very uh, interesting kind of bit so with the with the uh shaving foam mm. and it all goes down here now there's a shaving foam to me when i saw it it is a red herring yeah and uh he steals all of the uh embryos puts them in the shaving foam and then he sets off this domino rally of disaster where everyone's gonna die and Jurassic Park is gonna is gonna fall apart, and the dinosaurs are gonna run amok, and um, and it was all for nothing because at the end of the day, the shaving foam gets buried under a ton of mud, right? Yeah. And I think it's sort of this dramatic irony. I love it. I love the fact that that is it. That is all you see. That's the end of the shaving foam storyline. That's what happens. So it's sort of like really weird to know that. Steven Spielberg was kind of going, well, when we make a sequel, everyone's going to be wondering about the shaving foam, right? And it's like, yeah, no. That's what, I, that's what I thought. Everyone thought, Did like, you really? oh, they, they're going to find that shaving foam for the sequel. It's got to be. It's got to be. You know what I mean? And it was just, oh, it's just another island. Oh, OK. Because he didn't yeah. steal all of the embryos, did he? He stole some of them and he put them in the shaving foam. So there'd be other places to get the embryos from. I just think it's it's that he's caused all of this, all of this destruction for nothing. But do you think that's, that is essentially the film's kind of subplot. That's already come to an end. You know, there's no. Yeah. So usually they don't have that subplot can run out a little bit to the end of sort of things that sort of either tee up. You know. Um, sure. But that, this is basically yeah, you're saying, boof, come to an end, covered up with mud, move on. But he's but he's spinning plates, isn't he? It's kind of like mm. uh, there's that storyline that's over. Uh, but uh, but that's really kind of like um, he's the bad guy. He's uh, switched off all of the security and safety measures on the park. Now he's dead, and uh, we're moving on. But just so you know, his entire plot was pointless because nothing ever happens with the embryos, and I love that. I think it's I think it's funny and I think it's really surprising that people were obsessed with the fact that you know oh something's going to happen it's a, it, for me it's it's someone misunderstanding their own film in the same <laughs> way that Ridley Scott misunderstood the space jockeys in Alien it's kind of like you don't need a film about them you know, he was saying, "I always found, you know, I always found it interesting that nobody ever explored the uh, space shop." And you go cigar, uh, with you his know. big cigar, <laughs> and it's kind of like, uh, "No, why, why, why do you find that? That's not that." The thing about a space jockey is that it makes that universe seem huge. Because there's an alien that has been attacked by an alien and we've not heard of any of these species before and it's terrifying and we're all alone and we're in the depths of outer space and it's cold and we're going to die out here. And that's what's amazing about Alien. And with this, it's that it's a dramatic irony that there's all of this trouble that has been caused. Like, how is this car breaking these branches? The, it, that, that car is stuck. You were saying earlier about um, sort of maybe errors, and I sort of highlighted continuity. But the biggest problem, wasn't it, is like that the T Rex was literally level with the with the pavement, and then suddenly the car's pushed off this cliff ravine, yeah. And then suddenly Ellie gets down there very quickly. How must be some steps or something around the side to get there. So that was kind of like 
in terms of the structure of the sort of the location doesn't make sense with its geography. No. So, but that's it's, that's movie making, isn't it? They're, they're always going to do these little shortcuts. But that Spielberg taking, you know, license, he's like going, is the thrill worth the, um, with the reality? Yeah. And, uh, and I think also, I think, although he storyboarded a lot of stuff, you know, St Steven Spielberg turns up for work every morning and says, well, how do we make this better? What if, what if this sequence, you know, uh, ends with the car getting pushed over a, a ravine. And it's kind of like, well, we'll make that work. He's less interested in the specifics and the details and more about yeah, yeah. does that work and does that, do we sell it in the moment? And, and yeah, I think... It, I, oh. I, I, even though it I know it, 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 it doesn't it, 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 bother it's never, me. It's, it's never bothered me. Uh, I always found it was quite amusing because it, 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 when you're a kid and you sort of see... You know, an era of of like that. You think, oh my god, that's it's like that's like the kind of the shows you the signs of movie making. You know, it's not. Yeah, you know, nothing's perfect. Yeah, but I, but in the moment, I'm always sort of uh, it's always sold to me. You know, and I always I always buy it, and it's just like, yeah, this is uh, this is great. And also, I always just think maybe it's a different part of part of the uh, the road that they get pushed off. I know it's not. <laughs> But it doesn't. It does. It just doesn't matter. To I me. think someone someone was so obsessed with the film. Uh, I think I'd point that continuity continuity error out, and they sent me a map of that location. I think they emailed it to me, but they just drew their own map. I'm like, well, that's not the official map, is it? You know, of that location. You just kind of recreate it yourself. It's, you know, it's there's not evidence. You know, but Listen. you know, good for them. And that's and that's how they see it in their head, you know. Um, and and why not? Are you kind of excited to see the you know like um, uh, Sam Neill and Laura Dern and uh, Jeff Goblin return for the next Jurassic Park movie? They're not Han, Luke, and Leia. Do you know what I mean? Then it's not the same as. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. It's not. It's still good though. It's still fun. I still like seeing Sam Neill, you know, in this series. And Laura Dern as well. Sure, I like Sam Neill. I like Laura Dern uh, in this series, and I like uh, Jeff Goldblum. Um, I'm just looking at this Tyrannosaurus Rex with glowing green eyes. <laughs> they're they're literally glowing the dark eyes here. So this is the CGI model, which has got these huge eyebrows, which aren't really there on the animatronic. No, it's kind of it looks, it kind of it's, it's, it's thinner, doesn't it? Um, wasn't it? There's something on. Was it Netflix? Have you seen that? The movies that made us, or whatever. And they've got Jurassic Park's kind of covered, and and the uh, special effects guy who had really kind of pushed the the notion of using CGI instead of uh, go motion. Um, he had this sort of conundrum of having that T Rex kind of run after them, and he had to they had to cover up either the movement of its leg by as it sort of smashes into the tree. Things to, sort of. I think I think maybe the sort of uh, the physics of the T Rex didn't work very well, so they had to sort of. You mask it with it smashing into a tree yeah. branch. I think that's correct. <laughs> Maybe misquoting on that information. But that's allowed. I find it all fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's clever, clever trickery, isn't it? It's good. I find it fascinating. I just, I, I love. I, I mean, it's films like this that got me interested in filmmaking. Oh, really? It was this one. Okay. Uh, this well, it's films like this, films like this, because the special effects were so big. You you know you're not getting huge behind the scenes uh, uh, you know featurettes made about Howard's end you know and uh, <laughs> well, this be this is this to be on something like ITV wouldn't it on a Saturday afternoon the making of Jurassic Park you know it's such got it's got such mass appeal and it's changing films on such a grand scale that it would be like this Batman. Uh, you know, Independence Day, they'd be like, they would hammer away at how the special effects were made on all of these films. And um, and I just found it all fascinating. At the, at the time, I found it fascinating with the use of computers and um, and the combination of things. But when it, as we progressed through the 90s and into the noughties where the computers had taken over, I found the whole making off process extremely dull. 
because it was just watching a guy adjusting this kind of wireframe model and stuff. And I, you know, you'd rather watch footage of these model builders building the model, models, filming them at high frame rate, and then blowing them up. And that's the cool stuff yeah. you want to see, or yeah, seeing Stan absolutely. Winston's team, or or ADI kind of creating these monsters. You know, Stan Winston and seeing Stan Winston, and you know, oh, we can do this on the computer, and you go, yeah, you can, but, but should you? You know. <laughs> Shouldn't there be certain rules put in place that if well, you yeah, can't... I think it, that 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 sort of shift now in terms of filmmaking, in terms of visual effects, it, it's kind of now kind of become the, the idea of practical and CGI is sort of in the sort of coming together more uh, common. Now. It's more common now. There was a point where CGI was always taking over, but now we're seeing film, seeing filmmakers kind of use miniatures again and things like that, where. Lord of the Rings was very much the combination of both and it did it fantastically where, you know, we'd seen everything else prior to that kind of being an abuse. And that was it. That was once everyone kind of saw this new effect with Jurassic Park, they all, as you were saying earlier on, they thought they could do everything. And then we saw this major abuse of it during that period. Watching Jumanji again, I watched it in 4K. Just, the CGI was always kind of a bit off-putting for me, like the, the monkeys in the kitchen smashing all the plates. This doesn't look very good today, um, but there is some shots no. in there do look quite spectacular. But it was that that point where they went a bit too far. I watched the uh, I watched the Frighteners yesterday. Um, That's a good film. I really enjoyed that. It's, it is, it's really good. Um, the CGI has not aged at all. No, well, like the when he, you know, there's always one scene, wasn't it? I when he's it popping museum. up through the wallpaper and through the carpets yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. When, when you see things like Elm Street when it actually did it, like the guy pushes out of the wall. It looks amazing. That's terrifying. But but know? but it's a more subtle effect with Elm Street, and I think mm. I think actually with what Peter Jackson was trying to attempt with, um, and that era, that's the exact era that you're talking about when everyone abused CGI. Uh, Frighteners kind of like it does still feel like he's sort of holding off on completely um, you know there's still sort of like tension there whereas whereas uh, a lot of the time with when CGI was coming about it was just kind of like well we just show everything and there's not a lot of tension um, but nothing can, do you know, I'm like old school Rip Baker stuff. It's, it's yeah. like, that was my, and I was, I was too young for it or I wasn't even born, but I love going back and watching it. I, I don't have a problem with the shark in Jaws. I, you know, if it was a CGI shark, fuck me, no. And I've seen shark movies with CGI sharks. Well, it's like Deep Blue Sea, you know. Like, yeah, it's CGI, CGI. It's kind of like, um... Uh, it's, it doesn't. It's not convincing, but um, but this I can suspect as if it was a physical or Yoda, you know, a puppet Yoda versus a CGI Yoda. There's no, there's no comparison really. I saw this film recently called uh, I think it's called The Void. It's sort of like a John John Carpenter um, uh, homage. Uh, and that's got a lot of practical effects, and it's kind of like every single John Carpenter movie rolled into one. Um, oh wow! Was it good? Yeah, it, it's it's a bit weird because I love John Carpenter, so when I watch it, it feels like a knockoff. You know, it feels like, well, what film would you have made had John Carpenter not been born? You know. Because there's everything in there. It's The Thing, Assault from Precinct 13, Prince of Darkness, A Mouth of Madness. It's got everything in there. And Halloween. And you kind of like go, yeah, but what would you have made? So I think it's sort of, it's a slight film because of that. But it has all of these practical effects that they're using to do uh, sort of HP Lovecraftian uh, monsters from another dimension. So What's it about that film, mate? Um... Colour out of space, you know, sort of use. Yeah, of, it's sort of, of a bit like stuff. that as well. Yeah, I'm yeah, I liked, I like that film. I like that. Um, this scene, great. Uh, all the ice cream. This is where his accent really comes off the rails, though, right? He's Scottish from in one shot, and then he's English in another shot. <laughs> but uh, this scene is the thing that really humanises uh, humanises him with the flea mark uh, with the. Um, 
Well, mommy, I can see the fleas, you know. Flea circus. <laughs> yeah. I always have it though when they when the kids come back to the uh, the, the, the visitors centre and see all the ice cream. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> he calls me a human piece of toast. <laughs> it's like sure. I will take that whole cake to myself, you know. It'd all be melting yes. by that point, yeah. so it wouldn't be, you know, a bit of a mess. Yeah, and you're an adult now, so um, you could just buy that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd rather have it for free, though, Nick. You know, I yeah, know. of course, of course. If, but... if, it's, if it's all all you can eat, you know what I mean? You're just going to go crazy. Just, you know. Okay. Okay, <laughs> it's your... Okay, sure. It's your life, but... <laughs> You can you can do that yourself, really. This is a very nice looking puppet, but it is a puppet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, do, I love it when it reaches for the branch. It's like. <laughs> However, the ones from um, Jurassic World, World, yeah, that's lying down after it's been attacked. It's got a really mm. long neck, and it's. Do you remember that in Jurassic World? That's right, yeah. I think that's one of the worst. I mean, it just shows that it's a skill that people have lost, is making these practical animatronic... Yeah, yeah. And there, was a, there was a weird thing at the time. I remember the director, is it Colin Trev... Is it Trevno or something like that? Uh, he had... Sort Colin Trevevero. Um He had sort of... Maybe... He was kind of quoted at the time like there's going to use a lot of practical stuff, and then when you went to see the movie, it was kind of like, where is it? You know what I mean? It was just that, and maybe the only bit where you've got the Velociraptors kind of their heads in that sort of metal cage <clears> bit, <throat> where the guy sort of stroking it, or the guy comes up close to it to see it, and that, that's kind of a, that is a puppet, so it looks really good. But as you're saying, the sort of the long when it's lying down, it didn't quite work as well. And the head, I remember the heads being a lot smaller in Jurassic World as well. That this, that seems ginormous when you see it kind of reach forward to a. Um, you know, grab the branch. But also the um, Velociraptor, as it hatches out of the shell, mm. in in Jurassic World, it's sort of overly, over-animated. It's mm. got spindly little fingers and it's always it's got all these ticks and twitches and stuff. And it's kind of like, yeah, 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 you're overly... It's, it's been over-animated, whereas... Even though it looks like a tiny little puppet, it sort of does a better job at selling what it's doing in this film. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly. so the Jurassic Park films, I would agree. I really love Jurassic Park 3. Um, I think uh, I didn't, but it's one of them films. I didn't even know they'd made one. And then I saw it advertised on TV and I went to see it that day. You know, there was no build up for it. There was no build-up for it at all. It was like Jurassic Park 3 is at the cinema, so I went and there was no build-up and I enjoyed it, but it was like um, uh, it was like the Jurassic Park uh, fad had come and gone by that point. Um, and I don't think there was much sort of hype for Jurassic Park it was 3 2000, anyway. Was it 2001 that came out or 2? Uh, it was 2. I think it was after... Maybe 9 11. I think it might have even been 2003. Mm. Oh, yeah, you might be right. Oh, no, yeah. no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Let me get this right. I'm going to say it was 2002. Uh, right, what do you think it was? I, I, I'm going to go with 2001, sort it. You know, I think it was the summer okay. of 2001. So it was 2001. I knew I was at university. <laughs> I've got a Jurassic Park 3 backpack. <laughs> I've still got it. I've still got it from upstairs. Because I, I went to see yeah, Jurassic Park 3 and it was in like a small screen. It wasn't like, maybe it was like a week after it came out. but it, There was it no gone. hype for it whatsoever and I think it did mm. very badly. But I also think that now that we've got Jurassic World and all of the kids that grew up on Jurassic Park are grown up and they're adults now. So Jurassic Park lost a lot of its traction and has built it up again because we, we are the generation that grew up with it and now we're adults and it's got prominence in society. Well, that's why Jurassic World did so well, wasn't it? Because adults took their kids to say, this is the movie we, I grew up watching, you know, you can experience now for the first time, like on the big screen. And the, the problem is, you know, I, there's, a lot, there's parts of Jurassic World I, I quite liked. Uh, the sequel was, I thought, was absolutely appalling. The Fallen Kingdom or something like that, you know. I, I liked Fallen Kingdom. Did you? Um, 
I thought it's, it sort of turned into Resident Evil by the end. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I, absolutely. Why not? Because <laughs> I just think that it's, it's weird. I just don't understand why they're... I, I'm not desperate to see the dinosaurs on the mainland. Um, I feel like... Um, I mean, I hate Jurassic Park, The Lost World. I just... Yeah, I absolutely can't stand it. What kind of really annoyed you about that? I, for me, it was just, I just thought it was just really boring. I think it's one of the most smuggest films I've ever seen. Mm. They're just sort of, it's just a whole multi million dollar production that's just smelling its own farts for two hours. It's just, <laughs> I, I, I just. And Jeff Goldblum's character is completely out of character. He's not. It's not the character we knew. Different, in the first he, he's one. he's not. He's not a lead character. Um, mm. And uh, everything with his daughter is annoying. Um, uh, Vince uh, Vince Vaughn is kind of like distracting in it. Um, and I like Vince Vaughn. Uh, I don't think the special effects are as good. I think that the other team of dino enthusiasts are annoying. I think the bad guy... What's great about this is it's human error, you know, and human... For even Dennis Nedry, he's not really a bad guy. He's sort of... He's out for his own interests. But he's only the bad guy if you think of uh, Richard Hammond as the good guy, and Richard Hammond isn't a good guy. You know, yeah. so 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 it's really great in Jurassic Park too. They've got to have these moustache mus- twirling villains and well, yeah, they got like the the corporate guys who are just generic bad guys. You know what I mean? It's um, shit. It's just and so I, uh, well, the one actor I liked about it was uh, Pete Postlethwaite. I think he was just he was, you know, right. he was kind of phoning it in, but he was kind of just like he's Pete Postlethwaite. He's he's always good. So. Um, I'd rather have him not been in that film. I think it's a terrible film. Um, but Jurassic Park 3, you know, Jurassic Park built up all of this sort of love for this franchise, which has really sort of failed to... I mean, it's not a franchise. It's one great film. And, um, and, and so straight away, their first sequel, I mean, that's a brilliant shot. It only needs a bit of tweaking for that to be. Or the Gala Minus. Just the T Rex on top of it, really. It's it's brilliant. It's a brilliant shot. And this is really funny because obviously Alan Grant loves dinosaurs and he's like torn between looking after the kids. <laughs> like, oh, the blood. It's like... He's got to look after the kids, but he's also seeing dinosaurs with his own eyes and it's great, <laughs> great Spielberg joke. Um yeah, by by the time Jurassic Park three came along, the franchise was pretty much dead, and uh, and so why not have a ninety minute romp where there's just wall to wall dino action? I watching it now, obviously, I I find it sort of irritating. Tia Leone and William H Macy are sort of a kind of an annoying. William H Macy is playing Ned Flanders, isn't he? Sort of. Um... It looks like well, yeah, it even looks it's like crazy. him as well. Yeah, it was a human version of that planet. I found, yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I wouldn't watch any of them. And I remember being a bit annoyed actually by the T Rex getting just defeated so quickly with that new yeah, one. Yeah, and goes, that was a, <laughs> breaks its neck, you know. But it, that it was a real look, mistake. It was, isn't it? You killed a fan favorite. People, you know? they completely underestimated how much people love the T Rex. But again, the story like the, the story about the making of Jurassic Park Three sounds absolutely fascinating, um, and then Jurassic World. It's kind of like um, I didn't. I again, I didn't like it. I felt it was sort of um, a bit misguided and a bit of a cynical. It felt cynical. And, you know, this stuff's set up like there's the parents that are getting divorced and then nothing happens with that storyline in no, the follow-up. No. And they also the two kids and the two kids and the older brother's just a twat, you know, just bullying him and he's upset. and just like, mm. Yeah, and the, other, the, the older brother's a creep, you know, he's sort of like perving on girls and stuff. It's just, it's just uh, you know, and it's... Uh, so there's there's a lot to... Uh, I, I think Chris Pratt is miscast in it. I think he's such a funny guy that why would you have him playing the straight role? And even 
um, Alan Grant, who is kind of like got this gruff exterior, he's a really funny character. And I just think that the Chris Pratt part is a case of we haven't really got a character on paper, but if we cast Chris Pratt, he'll make it into something. And he doesn't really. And it's sort of a bit a bit sort of disappointing. Whereas with Fallen Kingdom, it's like, oh, right, uh, we've blown up the island uh, and now there's this super beast that is stalking people in a haunted mansion uh, uh, and there's a clone <laughs> of a girl and it's bonkers. And I'm just like, yeah, at least you've done something completely different, you know. And you've got, uh, what's his name, Ted Levine in it from... Um, uh, uh, Buffalo Bill from Science of the Lambs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's such a great villain, isn't he? He's got. A, he's a brilliant villain. He's great in it. And and do you know what I mean? It's kind of like it's there's Jurassic Park, and then there's you know three kind of thousand <laughs> layers of shit, and then there's all of the Jurassic <laughs> Park sequels. Um, but. I, I don't know what I don't know what they're doing with the with the with the next film. It's um, I, all I know is like a kind of you know dinosaurs on the mainland, but um, and it's taken them six films to get there, and it's kind of like that. Maybe true, that should also, have just I don't really been want the sequel. To go there. I, I like it in this theme park environment, but you can't repeat that. Like what I love about Jurassic Park, what I love about Jurassic Park is the theme park. Right, I love the theme park. I you're love... trapped in it and you can't get out or something. You know? It's the same thing with Die Hard, you know. It's kind of like you've got a guy mm. who's in an, in an office block and now he's going up all the lift shafts and everything like that. And when you take that out of Die Hard, it's problem solving. It's, it's not just, oh, there are these dinosaurs. It's these people that are stuck on this fucking island with the electricity's off and they're surrounded by... Um, dinosaurs and it's kind of like the thing that could save them are these electrified fences and you've got one team of people that are trying to switch them on one trying to team of people that are trying to climb over them you know it's kind of like it's not about dinosaurs all of the time and when they've made the sequels it's kind of like right well how many ways are we going to fit dinosaurs into this and it's kind of like it's not just about that and i love all of this navigating yourself across this theme park and I love the world building where you've got these maps of this fictional island everywhere and um, and the pat lunch boxes that are on display. Yeah, I, I love all of that. And for them to sort of like, there's none of that really in the Lost World. And, um, well, no, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's the, the, obviously it tries to repeat itself by going back to another island, but there's no, but they go in with like too many characters and firepower and it's sort of, literally dilutes the horror they're all you know. and it's it's black and white they're all self-righteous um you have horrible deaths for some people that don't deserve it you know there's that guy that gets eaten by the two t-rexes and um and it just feels like it, it sort of missed the point of its own kind of thing whereas uh you know i like the bit in dress part three when they come across the old visitor centre. Yes. And it's all overgrown and it's spooky because it's kind of like people used to be here. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it does, does a really good trick of the, the raptors are following them. You know what I mean? You see them in the background, like shadows and whip past the camera. Then she looks in the in the glass and you see the raptor the opposite side. That's clever. Clever direction, you know. Yeah. And I want to just emphasise, it's not as good as Jurassic Park. But out of all of the terrible sequels, it's maybe it's maybe my second or third favourite. And then there's a huge gap. I like, uh, yeah, I like I like the second Jurassic World one because um, I just it was better than the first Jurassic World one in terms of what I was expecting. This is really interesting. This sequence, so Samuel L. Jackson was meant to have a death scene, but the hurricane hit. And um, uh, so they couldn't film it. So Spielberg, using his Jaws uh, experience, worked out a way of doing it without seeing it. So they didn't film that shot. And they cut a bit as well. So she's going to... This is the bit when she walks backwards and Samuel L. Jackson's arm lands on her shoulder. Uh, this bit's funny and exciting. Now the kid gets shocked, doesn't he? And... Uh... 
But yeah, I mean, for a PG, you see this kind of disarm. Just like well, blood and stuff hanging off it. They get away with it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense that, what, a raptor has bitten his arm off. And then put it What's there. he done with the rest of the body and then hidden it behind the things for it to walk? It doesn't... <laughs> I know, this is like these steel pipes, you know. It's not the same as the boat in Jurassic World, in Jurassic Part 2, The Lost World, where there's this ghost, there's this Dracula-esque a Dementor ghost ship that arrives in San Diego <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah, like yeah. A, a hand on the steering wheel. It's just like, <laughs> who ain't <laughs> a fucking... And get the there. T-Rex get into the little thing, eat his entire body and just leave his hand on the steering wheel. It's like, <laughs> his little hand went the, in like this and tried to grab him, you know. And I, th- I think it goes to show exactly how close to the line Spielberg goes. Do you know what I mean? It's not like to being ridiculous, you know? It's kind of like he he rarely crosses the line to the point of this is bullshit. And when he does, it's kind of like, yeah, that's bullshit, right? But it's all bullshit. He just sells it really well. So this bit, when she walks backwards and it's kind of like, there's the arm. Who put the fucking arm there? Right? Brilliant. So now she backs off and she trips over his leg. And she finds the rest of his body, right? And when she falls over, she hurts her leg, and now she's limping. Mm. Oh, wait, right, so I've asked where I've cut it. So there was another bit in there where, the, right, rather than showing all of Samuel L. Jackson's death scene, they just showed his remains. And then they, I don't even know if they filmed it, but you can Google it and you'll find uh, Samuel L. Jackson's sort of like um, remains are from Jurassic Park. And there's a leg and an arm. And basically, she bumps into the arm, she sees the arm, and then she trips over his leg, and then she hurts herself, and then that's why she's limping for the rest of the film. A little there fun go, fact thanks. there. There you go. Clever girl. Clever girl. But, you know, it's that that's kind of the limitations of filmmaking. You know, when we're talking about CGI... I don't know if seeing Samuel L. Jackson getting murdered by a velociraptor would have improved the film, and I don't know I think, whether... I think ultimately, it would have been cut anyway if it was kind of, like, went through the censors. They would have put to cut it. And, and if you've they... Got, you've, got, you've got too many, you know, a certain amount of violence you can have for them to get away with it. And um, this is quite clever as well. They're using the you know, the, the leaves to cover up the guy getting eaten. Uh, his, his face eaten as well. Um, if you'd have seen the leg, would that have improved it? Um, you know... And and like I said, that's been cut. So, um, so it's about restraint. And this is sort of one of the one of those films where um, it was the birth of CGI, where it's now going to be commonplace from this moment onwards. There's going to be virtually. There's going to be straight to DVD or straight to VHS Tremors sequels coming out soon uh, that are going to have completely CGI monsters yeah, from this moment yeah. on. It's not about a prestigious tentpole movie. It's about filling up blockbuster video shelves with monster movies, right? Yeah, and with, and this with is the birth names you're familiar with, you know. And so this is this is showing you we're using CGI sparingly. We're also letting your imagination work. You're imagining what happened to Samuel L. Jackson rather than seeing it explicitly. And you, you get a lot less of that these days. I'm, I'm, su- I'm quite surprised and actually quite happy that Jurassic Park didn't fall down that route with its sequels where there were direct-to-video kind of affairs where, you know, like, like Dark Man was and Tremors with under Universal where they, you know... I suppose, I suppose down to the fact that because it's made so much money that it would be stupid to go straight to video. But, you know, it could have done, you know, by the third one, you know. That's a really interesting point, though, because, like, uh, Tremors um, is essentially Jaws with a different director. Um, it's it's And it's a B-movie. Yes. This is, this is a B-movie as well, isn't it? It's a B-movie plot with... A... Jurassic Park, this is absolutely a B-movie, but it's sold like this is the height of... 
the cinema. It's like a Roger Corman kind of idea with this sort of like loads of money thrown at it, you know. I mean, again, she's eating jelly and now she's scared. So the jelly is shaking. That's, that is like one of the most Spielberg things. That you, Spielberg oh, yeah, sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like when he comes up and he breathes on the on the window. <laughs> That's all, but yeah. I, 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 as a kid, I remember that being terrifying because like, the kids, because the dinosaurs are so loud, they cover up their ears. But when the raptors call out, you know, it's just like, whoa, you know, hearing that surround sound was just mental. Do you remember there was a kids' film starring Christopher Lee that came out a couple of years after this? Oh, what? And his, his character was called The Raptor. I never watched it. And he has a scene where he comes up to a window and he smokes a pipe. <laughs> and when he comes up to the window, he just breathes the smoke out of the thing. Um, <laughs> Also, because you know, like I mentioned very early on about the sort of dinosaur craze with things like Super Mario Brothers from like, I think maybe this thing was the same year. This was a bit earlier on in the year. But remember, there's that Whoopi Goldberg movie where she's... Theodore edit- Rex. As- yeah, yeah, yeah. Stupid shit like that. You know, just to entertain kids. Well, let's have a dinosaur. Someone dressed up as a dinosaur, you know. Uh, so was Super Mario just- Brothers before this? It was... I think it, I think it came out the same was time. It? It was 93, still 93. Super Mario Brothers was 93. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it was earlier on in the year. I think maybe in sort of May time. When was Dinosaurs? Uh, I don't know, release, obviously, because release schedules are always kind of different, weren't they, for US and UK and parts of Europe. But that had, you know, an, another reality where dinosaurs evolved, didn't they, into humans. Um, so it was all... Something was, yeah, I was saying, something was going on at the time with this, this kind of obsession with dinosaurs. It's saying something, though, isn't it? Because the CGI dinosaurs in Super Mario Brothers aren't uh, that bad. Um, They've got animatronic sort of things, aren't they? But oh, sorry, the animatronic, like... the animatronic dinosaurs aren't that bad in, in, in Super Mario Brothers. And if it came out before Jurassic Park, it's saying something about how bad Super Mario Brothers is that it didn't steal any of the thunder from this, you know? There's that there's that tar pit sequence in Last Action Hero as well when he lands in the tar and there's these oh yeah yeah uh, dinosaurs around it and Arnold Schwarzenegger was on set saying we're going to be number one we're going to beat Jurassic Park and it's like he have yeah. got dinosaurs and all this stuff you know I remember at the Oscars for best special effects uh, Jurassic Park was up against Cliffhanger and the old school uh, practical effects guy in my heart was really rooting for Cliffhanger to win. <laughs> I'm gonna, of course Cliffhanger's not going to win. Of course <laughs> of course, Cliffhanger's not going to win Best Special Effects in the same year as Jurassic Park, Nick. <laughs> they threw a miniature helicopter at a wall <laughs> in slow motion. It's not going it's, to... It's no comparison. There's no comparison. I'll tell you what I saw the other day. I saw Face Off. Oh, face off! Yeah, I, I never, I never gelled with that movie. I thought it was very silly. I've never. It is ne- silly. John Woo's American movies just didn't gel with me, apart from Hard Target. So I, I like Hard Target. I saw Mission Impossible two uh, a couple of months ago, which I thought was unwatchable, um, <laughs> especially next to Dre- uh, next to the first Mission Impossible, and then the third one is kind of like yeah, sure, um, but the the second one is awful, and then when you watch Face Off. Because there's like death and blood and it's quite gory, it kind of sells all of that stuff a bit more. But John Woo's style of filmmaking was so cool and until you look back on it and then you go, Oh, it's a bit of shit, isn't it? Um but what <laughs> I thought time, was, isn't it, really? what I thought was great about Face Off is like it's like it it represents a window in time that didn't really exist before or after which was, this is an action movie, uh, and it's not got Schwarzenegger, it's not got Stallone, and it's got Nicholas, Oscar winner Nicolas Cage and Oscar winner or nominee John Travolta. And they're in this action movie that is practical stunt heavy, where they haven't even bothered CGI in their faces over the stunt people's faces so it gets to a point towards the end when they're in a speedboat chase 
and you're now watching two guys that haven't been in the rest of the film <laughs> show up and fight. On a, you go, who are these two? <laughs> who are these two guys? <laughs> um, it's sort of like this. It's it's sort of like this weird sort of like window. Where it's just like this would all be CGI now, and they wouldn't be on a speedboat. They would be on a spaceship that was in Earth's atmosphere. It'd be the end of Black Widow. You know, this is how you would finish a film, right? And it's sort of like this really quaint time before. Uh, before CGI was like the only option. Um, this moment here, when she hacks into the, the mainframe system, I always they threw in one line of dialogue, don't they? Earlier on, that she was a computer hacker, you know, and it's just like that was that one one little bit just to sort of justify this whole sequence. There's no opportunity for her to hack any computers when they're stranded in a forest, yeah, when they're in the jungle. So they're going to have to do it like that. Um, wasn't the, in the book the boy is older and he's the hacker and this is a really great change the reverse the roles don't they it's a great it's a great change that they did I think these kids are brilliant I think he is great I think she's great I think it does a it does a really brilliant job of you really kind of like they're not annoying kids and if they are annoying they're deliberately annoying you know Mm. No, no, I, I never, I never had a problem with the kids in this. It's always when you do see many films that sort of have the kids be supporting characters throughout the entire movie, they can often be very irritating and just sort of like put you off it. But Spielberg's always had that skill of, you know, of directing kids extremely well. So you kind of like you can put up with them and just sort of they, they're either you know, or to, but to make it to make them work is to them to be somewhat relatable or, you know, amusing, and that sort of plays off yeah. well here. This bit coming up when the raptor jumps up and tries to grab the girl's leg, you know, that was everyone jumped out of their seat when I, when they first when I first saw it. Which bit? You know, when they're sort of you know they're climbing up just above the computer room and oh, and she falls. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's great because the stump the stump woman's like like she goes from like a little child to an adult in one. Well, this is it. This is the, this is the shot. So she looks down, and when she looks up by accident. That was the stunt woman. And so they CGI the girl's face over the stunt woman's face. That's right, yeah. And yeah. when you look at it, that is... Um, it's a quick shot and it works. It, that's it, it Gattaca. Well. That's Gattaca projected all over his face. That's DNA. Uh, that's that, so clever, isn't it? And so this bit when she falls through... She falls through... There, When she looks up, that's the stunt woman. There. And they've CGI'd her face, the kid's face on there. Brilliant. And yet Face Off was made five years later. <laughs> What's and, going, why has Nicolas Cage got more hair? <laughs> why has Nicolas Cage got a completely different haircut? And <laughs> Like, he, he's got a completely different haircut. It's crazy. Um, I love this bit when they've got to climb all over the dinosaur uh, fossils. To escape the dinosaurs that are trying to kill him. It's brilliant. I love the, uh, as always, with Baffley, I think I said in my review at the time, where the T Rex managed to squeeze himself through the visitor centre's entrance to sort of grab the raptor. You, you, no one hears him come in, but it's just no, sort of. Like... Yeah, and earlier he couldn't, take, he couldn't take one fucking step without everything vibrating. And now, <laughs> you know. He's wearing sneakers. And now he's like sneaking around doesn't bother me no, none of it bothers me <laughs> Did, have you been on the Jurassic Park ride in is it Florida Universal the river ride um, I think I, I think it's the river ride yeah I think I, I think went on it I think it's still there isn't it yeah I think they've redone it for the Jurassic World films I think I went on it before they redid them um, okay yeah, it's, rebranded it yeah. it's great it's great you know this is a really fun family film. There's not really any shocks to it, but I love that T-Rex. I love the branding. I love the world that it creates. Um, I think it's great. And Jaws yep. is a terrifying movie. And mm. I think Jaws is just works on another level to this. But this is, this is a really entertaining film. I like the book as well. Was this the last um, Dean Cundy movie that he photographed for Spielberg? 
Because obviously Dean Cundy was John Carpenter's guy, wasn't he, for so many years, and he jumped to Spielberg. And um... this will be something that you know and I don't. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a, you know, the, the, you always remember the sort of Jurassic Park and its kind of the, its its colours and its sort of brownish kind of warm vibe throughout the entire film. And uh, Dean Cundy's photography is kind of all over it. And uh, I think he may have done the sequel one, perhaps, but maybe I don't know. I can't remember now. Um, but that's interesting when you're talking about the way it's lit and then when you're lighting a CGI character, how how does that kind of... Um, how much control does he have? I suppose play, play in... Yeah, so how much, how's, it, how's it going to play into matching the real elements? You know, I mean, that is a fairly bog-standard shot, right? There's not a lot yeah. that's going on here. They're in Hawaii. They've got beautiful... <laughs> scenery around them and they're kind of like you let, you let the scenery do the work don't you um but everyone's got a monster tan in this film i think maybe down to the color grading perhaps as well but one of the things we didn't point out is that you know every time you see a fence in Jurassic park if you look at the edges you can just about see the fence run out of fence where i never noticed that the fence the, oh yeah, when you when you see the big the big gates at the beginning of the film, um, uh, the fence goes on for about three feet either side, and it's not really keeping anyone <laughs> in. And they've just sort of like erected these bits of fence, and you know they're filming the edges. And it's like, it as a kid, you're out of Hornby train sets. Oh fuck, I'm out of track. That's exactly <laughs> what it is, though. It's kind of yeah. Um, but this is great. He's like saying he's looking at her, going, "Yeah, I like kids now." So, whether they get divorced or were they separate, I don't think they were married. Were their characters? I think they sort of separated, and that's the thing. And was she in number three? She's she's with someone else, and they've got a child. And he's like, oh, that kind of thing has been lost. But his stubborn ways of like, no, I, I, I like these kids, but I don't want any of my own. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go through the early. T- I mean, I always thought this was meant to be like a pterodactyl. I thought that as well. But it's, just, but it's a bird. It's just to show you the evolution, you know. Mm. Um, beautiful music. Um, yeah. Final thoughts. What are you thinking? Now that we've talked our way through Jurassic Park. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's still an absolute masterpiece. It's still extremely watchable. You know, I watch it probably once a year still, you know. I, I never really get tired of it. I think at the time, after its kind of its success and after Lost World, I think Lost World sort of sort of destroyed my enthusiasm for the kind of series. I think I kind of got older and you sort of lose interest in dinosaurs anyway. I think you always, they always sort of come back round, you know, uh, and that's what... Jurassic Park 3 was, as you were saying, kind of just sort of came out and wasn't really much hype behind it, but I kind of watched it just due to the fact that it was another big film at the cinema and the reviews weren't kind of like as harsh as I recall compared to Lost World. I think word of mouth had kind of sort of spread about the sequel being a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a letdown, but it still made huge amounts of money. So people still went to see it in mass numbers, but um, what the, I, I think the, the sort of the Lost World, Lost World. Yeah. I mean, Lost World um, had stiff competition in Batman and Robin that year. <laughs> I remember because it was a double-sided poster from Empire magazine. Yeah. Oh, uh, was it? Jurassic World on one side and Batman and Robin on the other. Oh, Fuck me. Two stinkers on one poster. Well, Lost World is not as bad as Batman and Robin. But I would. Um, what, I, what, I suppose what tells what mood you're in. I suppose. You know. I, I I do like them equally less. I mean, I do, I I, I, I wouldn't re- I wouldn't I wouldn't watch either of them. I wouldn't choose. To, I watched. <laughs> I watched Jurassic. Like, yeah, yeah. I watched The Lost World last year in lockdown, and I spent the entire film screaming at the screen. I hate it. Um, I love Stan Winston. I was twelve when this came out, so I was almost a teenager, and it was probably my last gasps of um, being into dinosaurs the way I was when I was a kid. And maybe it reinvigorated it slightly. And then when Jurassic World... Uh, Jurassic, oh, it's confusing, isn't it? When The Lost World came out, um, I think I was I was too old for it, maybe. And I was into other things. I was into 18 certificate uh, buddy cop movies, like Bad Boys. I was obsessed with Bad Boys by that point. And um, 
And so I'm, I'm really, a lot of what, a lot of my opinions on this franchise are based around nostalgia and that um, I'm really grateful that this film came out when it did because um, it was probably my last gasp of my dad taking me to the cinema and me being absolutely terrified and, uh, go, you know, and going to the car in the car park at the end and talking to my dad about it and... Um, so, yeah. so I, I, I love this film for that reason. I love the book. That's what I was going to say. I really love the book. The book, um, I used to have the abridged tape version of it. Um, that was narrated by, uh, John Hurd, the dad from Home Alone. And it was great. It was great. It starts off with sort of like the rain hitting a corrugated roof and, I used to just switch it on and listen to it until I fell asleep. And I love Michael Crichton's books. I love The Lost World. Um, so do you think the book of Lost World is better than the film then? The, I think the book of The Lost yeah. World is a great sequel to Jurassic Park. I think the film... I still, we've, I've got the hardback of that downstairs. I need to read that. Oh, I really I love said, it. I said to myself, I said to myself, I'm going to read this, The Lost World after reading the first book I never got around to it I loved it um, I think it came out before the film as well and I read it and he did was... yeah very quickly because he, he didn't want to do it I think I, I recall Mark, Mark Crichton was kind of paid a shitload of money to basically write this sequel but... yeah and I think I, 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 I don't know I was I was, I read it before the film I think I was disappointed in the film I loved the book and I wrote because uh, Arthur Conan Doyle Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a book also called The Lost World. So when I was at school, I wrote a comparative essay about the two of The Lost Worlds. Um, oh, right. I, I fucking loved The Lost World. I think I probably preferred it to the Jurassic Park book. Um, mm. It's a really weird franchise where they've taken that first book and they've wrung out as many set pieces out of it as possible and they're still turning up in films today you know there's still there's still ideas that they threw out in the first Jurassic Park book and film that they're still thinking oh well maybe we could use that as a starting off point well um, it's, like, it's, like the, it's like the Bond films you know what I mean they go back to the old books even short stories and take a little nugget of something and then put it in one of the later films people are like oh my god that's so and so and so you know I, I can I, I can completely understand that uh, with James Bond because it's like this a decade spanning franchise that's got so many different entries in it. But Jurassic Park is two books and the first screenplay, and they're still doing ideas that they didn't do in that first film in five, you know, five films later. Um, I, I don't think it's a great franchise. I think the film is brilliant. I think the first film is brilliant and everything else is sort of a, uh, a mixed bag of, hit and miss stuff that um that i can take or leave it's a bit like yeah. uh i like all the dra I, I like all the back to the future films to some degree but i can take or leave the sequels i think it's all about that first film and um and there, there wasn't a sequel to goonies you didn't need one you didn't really need a sequel to um jaws of course but um there were <laughs> You just don't need sequels to a lot of these films. Well, it's the laws of diminishing returns, wasn't it? Make as much money as you want. Make as much money as you can yeah. out of it, sure. I mean, this is an Amblin film. And it, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 love, I love it. I love the time of my life when I first saw it. I like revisiting it. Um, uh, I don't think... It, it's weird when you watch it back and you see that there's like 10 people in it. <laughs> you know, you're so used that's, to... That's to its benefit, you know. This, um... Yeah, absolutely. But there's, you're so used to these disaster movies, especially from that era where there was like... Oh, God, yeah. Well, it's a Roland Emmerich kind of thing. We've got so many characters and supporting characters where this is just like... It, it, it's, it's a small idea surrounded by these kind of dinosaurs. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's like a... It got it cost like sixty three million, but that's a tiny back then. Well, maybe seen as quite high budget, but now that feels that feels like a like a art house movie budget. Well, what but, was what was um, what was Last Action Hero? I think Last Action Hero was one hundred and twenty million. Something like that. Yeah, I think it was around that that ballpark. And Last Action Hero was the first film to advertise in out of space. They uh, they had uh, 
the title of the film and pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger put onto rockets and they sent them into space. And so that's where the budget goes. Uh, and Jurassic Park was kind of like, it had a book that it was based on and it had word of mouth and everyone was excited about it and it's dinosaurs. You know, they were here before us and if Jurassic Park has anything to say about it, they'll be here long after we've gone. There you go. Uh, a little perfect there sign off go. there from Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Pity we're going to talk about it for another half hour. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the commentary. Me and Nick will be back in future with some more. Take care, everyone, and goodbye.